my gavel for the first time. I don't need it in the other room. This room is a lot more lively and, and a lot of hospitality going. Is that better, Delia? Can you hear me okay? I will. I'll work on that. There we go. Uh, good afternoon. We are calling the regular meeting of the Del Mar College Board of Regents to order at 1 p.m. on Tuesday, November 8th. Uh, we are at our new Oso Creek campus in our Culinary Arts Building. Uh, this is the Trace Grace Community Room, and we are very happy to be meeting here for the first time. I want to give a special shout out and thank you to our facilities personnel for uh, moving all the furniture and getting everything set up for us and to our IT group uh, for getting all of the technology put together and the president's office, Ms. Pettis and, and Dr. Escamilla, thank you very much uh, for your work in getting uh, this location put together for us today. We're very happy to, to be here. I'm going to call a roll to establish our quorum. Dr. Adami? Here. Regent Averett? Here. Regent Bennett could not be with us today. Regent Garza? Regent Hutchison? Here. Regent Kelly? Here. Dr. Turner is, uh, we're not sure if she's going to be able to join us or not. She may be uh, running late. Uh, Dr. Villarreal? Here. I'm Carol Scott. We have a quorum and can conduct business. Uh, thank you all very much for being here today. Uh, please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. Regent Hutchison, would you uh, lead us in our Pledge of Allegiance, please? Yes. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And if you would all please join me in reading our Del Mar College vision statement. It is located on the screens around the room. Del Mar College, College will be the premier choice for life-changing educational opportunities provided by responsive, innovative faculty and staff who empower students to improve local and global communities. Del Mar College will be streaming our live audio and video from the official Board of Regents meetings on the college's website in real time, with the exception of portions of the meeting considered as closed session by statute. We now have the opportunity for anyone to address uh, the board on any item not on the agenda. Our general public comment. Is there anyone here for public comment? Seeing none, we will move into our recognitions for the day. Uh, we'll begin. Uh, Ms. Keyes is going to help us recognize Dr. Leonard Rivera. Thank you very much. Here, there we go. Thank you very much, Regents, and good afternoon. It's my pleasure to recognize Dr. Leonard Rivera, Dean of Continuing Education and Off-Campus Programs, and Rachel Benavides, Director of Adult Education Initiatives, and the entire Continuing Education team for receiving the coveted STARS Award from the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. This award is in recognition of providing exceptional contributions to the one or more goals of the new strategic plan, Building a Talent Strong Texas. Specifically, the continuing education team under the leadership of Dr. Rivera and Ms. Benavides highlighted their work in the Texas Reskill and Upskill through Education Initiative and utilizing the true grant funds of over $530,000. Although with other community, along with other community partners, such as Workforce Solutions of the Coastal Bend, and under the leadership of Ken Trevino and Alba Silvis, together they created post-secondary credentials of value for local targeted occupations in the workforce. This resulted in the redesign and alignment of short-term credentials that prepared continuing education students for employment and increased student accessibility to credit courses. These stackable courses take an industry-based credential and open the door for students to progress to a level one certificate and associate's degrees. They will continue with the Higher Education Conference in Austin this December and be recognized there by the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. I'd like to congratulate Dr. Rivera and Ms. Benavides and their team, and would they please come forward?
Congratulations, Leonard. I know this has been a lot of hard work. And Ms. Benavides and some other team members, come on up. And Ms. Silva. Ms. Silva. I'm saying hello, everybody. Come up, come up, come up, come up. Get the team up there, absolutely. So while you're taking the picture, um, the many of the regents will be in attendance at the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board Leadership Conference. And it's going to give us a great thrill to be able to applaud the work of our, um, off cam our continuing education and off-campus programming. Um, thank you very much for your hard work and for helping us recognize the great work that the Del Mar College is doing. Please, Dr. Rivera, say a few words. Well, thank you, uh, Regent. I appreciate that. Um, obviously, uh, we, we've put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into this. and. Uh, you know, it's, it's a combination of the folks that are standing right behind me that have made this possible. Um, you know, I, I have a great boss, Ms. Keys, great president, Dr. Escamillo, great board. I mean, obviously it takes everyone uh, and, and, and anyone on this college campus to make what we did today possible. And I want to recognize a great team, a great CE team, a great partnership. Uh, Ms. Alba Silva is recognizing the Workforce Solutions at Coastal Bend. Uh, we're, we're in tandem with them at every juncture, uh, working with industry, uh, really creating these types of innovative programs uh, in order to put people to work. You know, and that's what Delmar's about, is about getting them work ready. And we're just having to be doing it quicker than the average person. And, and we're doing it uh, within months as opposed to doing it in years. And that makes a big difference because when people are hungry, they're hungry today. They're not hungry a year or two years from now. They're hungry today. And this is what this team is about, putting people to work and listening and advising them and putting the love and care that it takes to make you know, their dreams come true. So I want to re recognize my team, uh, every single one of them, um, from the bottom of my heart, uh, as well as the uh, Dr. Halcom and her faculty. I'm going to be honest with you, the faculty are play a big instrumental role in allowing this to even take place. So Dr. Halcom, thank you so much and your faculty, uh, the deans, the chairs that uh, report to you. Uh, this could not be possible if it weren't for the cooperation of the faculty and the chairs that we have. And then lastly, I also want to recognize Patricia Dominguez uh, with our student support services and everyone that uh, she employs and oversees. Again, it's, a, it's really a, a community award, in my opinion. And so I want to thank her for everything that she does to support CE. And, and every day she's doing something that makes my life and our life easier. And so I have an old saying, it's, it's my college, it's our, you know, it's, it's really your college and it's our college. And so this is a community college. And thank you so much for allowing us to uh, be here today and, and joining you all in this celebration. So thank you all so much. Thank, thank you, all you team. Dr. Rivera. As a, I'm going to take a little uh, point of, of privilege here. I want to connect the dots for folks. The, the true initiative that was referenced uh, in, this, um, in this grant award uh, was about upskilling and, and reskilling uh, through some funding that was acquired during the last legislative session through the coordinating board. The success of that program, what we did here at Del Mar College, what other colleges around the state were able to do with that true initiative, is quite frankly what led to uh, one of the major recommendations in the Community College Finance Commission recommendations. Dr. Escamilla was able to chair the workforce uh, program, the workforce task group, uh, as part of that commission's work. And because of the success of programs like this, we've been able to include this kind of reskilling and upskilling specific funding in the commission's recommendations. So don't ever doubt that what you do with your individual students and in each classroom can actually affect statewide policy. This is a perfect example of where success in these kinds of programs has led directly uh, to a state recommendation that is gonna increase funding for these kind of programs statewide. So again, our applause to you, absolutely. Just one thing to add to that. I can't tell you how many times I was in Austin working on the commission and I call up Leonard, Leonard, tell me what to do here. I don't know what this means. Do I need to go left, right? What do, what do I need? And Leonard would write me a little prescription over the phone and I would go back and I'll say, this is the way it needs to be. And in my head, 
that's what Leonard told me we needed to do. So, I mean, this is, this is real. This is actually the way statewide policy and law is crafted, okay? No, anyway, Leonard, Leonard, thanks for your leadership and Patricia and the, to the team and everybody. Thank, thank you, everyone, faculty, staff, everyone who contributed to this. Appreciate it. Great job. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Ms. Mary, Mary McQueen uh, about an award for our college relations program from the National Council for Marketing and Public Relations. You know, we're so honored to have so many great stories at Del Mar College, um, but those stories could not be heard without the incredible technicians and craftsmen who create the storyboards that actually share some of the successes and the wonderful things that we do here at Del Mar College. And that's what the College Relations Office is all about, sharing those stories in the multitude of streams that are available right now. Um, so I want to recognize the um, College Relations team, and particularly Monica Benavides, who is our Creative Service Manager. She won eight uh, medallions at the National Council for Marketing and Public Relations, including um, one that was a, the Oso Creek brochure that, it, that they had them downstairs, but they don't have them anymore. I was going to show you, but um, it's, it's a great opportunity. The images and the story and the pieces that we have to share with the public is a great way to share what it is that Del Mar College is all about, and I am so honored to be part of, at least temporarily, this team that is doing the incredible work. I'd like all members of the College Relations team that's here, and particularly Monica, to come up and get some recognition. Thank you, Leonard. He's Johnny on the spot. So this is, <laughs> this is the uh, Oso Creek brochure, which is one of the ones that won a gold medallion. And the cool thing about this one is it has all the programs and the expected salaries, and it really is a marketing to the students to say this is what's possible, and here's some avenues that you can look at. So I, we're really excited. Monica, would you like to say something, please? Um, a lot of these awards were also for our rebranding, which was such an honor to get to do, albeit challenging during a pandemic with 27 focus groups. But uh, truly, it's an honor to get to be creative and have fun and showcase all of the amazing things that Del Mar College has to offer to everyone. So thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. And I know there's a much bigger team back at the office. Please tell them congratulations for us as well. Next, we will have our student success report. Patricia Benavides Dominguez is going to talk to us about Project Senda. Good afternoon. <clears throat> uh, Project Senda, as you know, is a Title V uh, grant that we were in uh, year three of that grant. Uh, Project Senda is a set of in interventions intended to expand the number of Hispanic and low-income students attaining a post-secondary degree and participating in a growing regional economy. The overall goal is to ensure the implementation of advising best practices across Del Mar College. Part of the process is a two-tiered certified uh, advising course, which enhances the skill set of the participants and Del Mar College advising processes and procedures. To date, 107 unique faculty and staff have participated in course offerings. With these results, the institution is expected to continue advising best practices as an outcome of the training received by both faculty and staff. Ultimately, the training will assist the institution in continuing to meet objectives set forth by the project long after the grant cycle has ended. Uh, uh, years one through three, I'm sorry, we're in year four. We've already done one through three. Years one and three of the project Senda have been deemed successful by external evaluators, and the grant remains on target to meet its objectives. 
there will be six, uh, there will be a 16 percent increase in annual number of Hispanic students earning an associate's degree from 863 students in 2018 to 1,000 in 2023 is our goal. The target for 2021 uh, reported year was 925, and the actual number earned uh, by Hispanic students was 947. So we are ahead of our goal. Uh, there will be a 19% increase in the three-year graduation rates of Hispanic students from 10.9 in 2017 to 13% in 2023. And right now, our, uh, we are at 11.5 in our actual percentage. Uh, we are we, I'm sorry, we, uh, we're going for 11.5 and our actual percentage for 2020-21 is 14.2. The annual number of, his, of Hispanic graduates successfully transferred to baccalaureate programs will increase from 178 in 2016 to 300 in 2023. The actual target for the reporting year of 2020-2021, uh, the reported year was, the reporting for that year was 2025 and our actual number was 244. So we are improving on all our metrics. Four success points. In this case, uh, in following the grant, the goal is to have lower numbers in all those categories. Uh, there will be a 4% decrease in the average credits uh, taken uh, to degree completion. And as you know, uh, back in 2018, we started at 93 hours uh, for de uh, degree completion, and now we're at 89. Uh, there will be a 9% decrease in the average uh, student debt from 12,059 in 2018, and now our number is at 11,197. Um, and then for our, uh, there will be an 8% decrease in the average time to degree completion. We started out at 5.1 years in uh, 2018, and now for the 2020-2021, we are, our number is, actual, is actually at 4.9. So these grant objectives highlight key wins in the Project Senda and Del Mar College. All data was collected in conjunction with the Del Mar Office of Institutional Research and the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. Additionally, another key milestone in the project has, has implemented a resource request form that is available to all faculty and staff to assist with expenses related to technology, professional development, office supplies. As, it's, as, it, as of its implementation in uh, April 2022, the program has fielded over 50 requests, totaling a over $100,000. These monies assist the college in the continuing uh, efforts of student success. And this would not be possible without David Barretta, our, our grant uh, director, and Leticia Wilson, our uh, director of advising initiatives. Thank you. Comments, Dr. Escamini, questions from board members for Ms. Benefitas? Thank you. Well, I'll just, I, I may, if I may. Um, so this, this program is in its fourth year now as a Title V uh, grant from from the U.S. Uh, Department of Ed, and so, as such, this is a a way of leveraging resources that we'd already had. We've been gaining momentum um, internally, and I'd like to thank Leticia and all the others out there that are that are that are on that in a day to day on a day to day basis are working with our own faculty and staff to train them to 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 improve their advising. We've been talking about elevating advising here for, for several years. And um, this, is, this grant is really leveraging. If there's one thing it's leveraging more than anything, it's our, advice, our capabilities and, and overall uh, implementation of advising for students. Um, this is a relatively small amount of money. It's not a very big grant, but it's a very powerful grant. That's the other thing about it. It's not like it's tens of millions of dollars or anything, but it is. It's a. It goes to show that um, that our people again are our greatest assets. And thank you so much, everybody, for who's contributed to this. And congratulations to everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Since I don't have my little screen up here today, if you do want to jump in, please jump in. Uh, moving on to our regents' reports, uh, Dr. Escamilla and I wanted to provide you with. 
uh, an overview of the recommendations that have come out from the Texas Commission on Community College Finance. Uh, first and foremost, thank you for uh, the opportunity and thank you for covering the expenses for Dr. Escamilla and I, the time for him and the expenses uh, for both of us to uh, go to Austin on a regular basis and to participate in the commission's work. Uh, it was uh, very, very, very meaningful work and we're excited about uh, where we are. Um, the recommendations were voted on at our October 17th meeting and passed unanimously from the commission. There was one slight change that is captured in, in this deck that you see today. The actual final report uh, has been given in final form, uh, but not a formatted version, we understand, to the governor, the speaker, and the lieutenant governor, and we're waiting on the final formatted version of the report uh, to be available publicly, which we expect literally any day now. Um, as a uh, side note for uh, those in the audience, Dr. Harrison Keller, the Commissioner for Higher Education, is going to be in Corpus Christi tomorrow to meet with a group of South Texas presidents and, and some trustees who are joining us uh, in a workshop session to discuss these recommendations and, and do a Q&A uh, with those college presidents and trustees from throughout the South Texas region. So we're excited that, that Del Mar College has had such an opportunity to be in a prominent role uh, I'm going to let Dr. Escamilla kind of take the lead on uh, the, going through the recommendations, and I'll provide color, color commentary as I am prone to do. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and just use the screen behind me, so pardon my left shoulder. Um, there's three primary pr pillars that have really uh, de been developed to, to stand up the recommendations uh, across the state. Now, uh, what, what I want to begin with is saying that, that we still have to get these recommendations through the legislative process. The good news, the great news is that this, is all, this has all been vetted um, by way of the, uh, the uh, State Higher Education Coordinator, uh, Higher Ed Commissioner Harrison Keller, uh, been vetted by, he and his staff, by him and his staff and taken through to the leadership of the state. So, so far, so good. Um, and so the three pillars are namely around uh, state funding uh, for outcomes. Um, currently, our, our funding, I'm going to move quickly through this. So state, currently, our, our appropriations are about round numbers, a little bit less than 20% uh, coming from the state. 80% of that bucket of money um, is, is really on inputs. And it's what we're going to be talking about here a little bit. It's all based on enrollment. Okay, things are going to flip according to this model. And we're going to be moving from um, of the, of the appropriations bucket of dollars, about 80% on inputs, moving to about 90% on outcomes. Okay. And it's going to be broken down in a lot of detail. And why, why I'm so glad to see all the faces in here. We're going to have a staff meeting this weekend, or this week, not weekend, Friday. <laughs> I'm not going to be here this weekend. And, and, and uh, good luck if you are. Um, uh, it, it, and it, it is because I need you all to learn this because this is going to put the, the report that we're about to, to, to disseminate to the regions on its ear maybe and it's going to flip things are going to change our roles are going to change our lenses are going to change uh, on how we see um, the outcomes next slide please so affordability to students I have never in, in my career um, seen so much effort um, intent and goodwill focused at the affordability factor for students. Everything in the old days, um, I'm just going to call them the old days because I'm hoping they're behind us, um, was always focused on merit-based. Well, when you're talking about students of need, and if you're just talking about the community college student, and you're talking about need-based versus merit-based, you put all your buckets over here, guess who you're leaving out? Everybody over here, right? I'm, I'm preaching to the choir. I get it. But affordability more than ever is going to be uh, focused on our students, namely through the TEOG grants being given more a balance to them. I think on average right now there's about 20, there's a 27 percent number of, of eligibilities of students eligible that are actually receiving those dollars to about 70 percent of those eligible. The other piece of all that is that financial aid, financial support for dual credit students coming from the state. Um, to a, to a maximum level of tuition allowable and so forth. I'm seeing the, the, the quiet applause out there. I think we all should be on our feet yelling right now, but uh, hold on, hold on tight. So, uh, so affordability uh, for the first time 
like never before, I should say, not the first time, but like never before is the second pillar that's gonna be afforded to our students. Next slide, please, Zach. Uh, continuing with the third part of, of all of that is, is, a, is a component of work-based learning. Um, there's gonna be a pot of dollars proposed for students out there. It's gonna be especially important on our, our CE and CTE, and who knows what all, all aspects of our colleges that, that companies and entities can go after to, to really bolster our internships and, and apprenticeships, and what are the other ships we're needing to <laughs> work-based learning, otherwise work-based learning kinds of things, to contextualize learning uh, with some money behind it for, for, for that particular part of the, the uh, program. Next slide, please. Um, and then investment in capacity. You know, we've been very blessed here at Del Mar College to be, to, to live in, in this community and to have the support of, of, our, of our board. And I'm, and I, and I'm just gonna say in our, in our previous iterations of our board to, to support us and make sure that we have, we have a strong footing. Not all colleges do. Um, more than half the community colleges out there are deemed um, medium to small colleges and they're very vulnerable. And maybe if you've ever worked at a small college, uh, I have in another state, but I'm just saying it doesn't matter whether you're in Texas or Illinois, when you're working at a small college, you always feel like you're um, threatened. And so uh, the dollars that are gonna be used uh, for, the, the, for, for, for these smaller colleges are gonna help them um, not only in the way of, of, of high demand fields and, and, and programs that are, that are, that are that, that'll be conducive to them, but, but through shared services and startup seed dollars and the like. So this is really uh, aimed, this third piece is really uh, uh, aimed at, at investing into the smaller colleges and stabilizing them. Of course, we, we can all benefit from the, from the high demand uh, fields, um, the stand-up uh, programs readily and so forth. So there'll be some buckets of dollars for some new programs in small colleges is what that's really about. I think that that's, that's the essence of what we're talking about. Uh, this last one, this is, the, this is the one, Leonard. So what we want, the slide, let me tie something together to, to our first award. I'm getting all the nods. They're like, Mark, we already understand. We know this, right? <laughs> I get that. Uh, Jeanette, I see, you, I see you smiling back there. Um, so, but convertible and stackable credentials, you know, this is what it's all about. So guess who the state was modeling all the way through this uh, to, make, to make this final component of the, of the third uh, leg of the stool, if you will. Um, it, they were modeling us. That's why we got the award. There's no, it's not a coincidence, right? And I was serious when I was calling Leonard from the Capitol and other places saying, tell me more about these, these, the nuances of these convertible and stackable credentials that will be supported by these investments of, and there's more dollars. All this to say, um, good job to the team on all that. Um, I think that should, be, that should be it, thanks Zach. All this to say, uh, this, this effort again has to go through the uh, a, a legislative process. Uh, we'll be asking some of you all to either go and or participate and testify and the like. Right now on the table uh, is 650 million new dollars for community colleges. That is the biggest investment, uh, and that's you know over a biennium and so forth. But you know it is the largest investment um, that has, frankly, ever been at one time ever been considered, and that's the amount of money that's being put behind these three these three pillars. Uh, of our plan. Madam Chair. So my, my color commentary is going to go back to uh, the, first, uh, the first slide on state funding for outcomes. Uh, the, to me, the, the critical piece, there's, there's a couple of critical pieces in this slide that I, that I want to make sure are not overlooked. One is the, the statement that this is going to be a dynamic funding model. So as opposed to colleges competing for a set pie that is relatively the same every biennium, uh, we will truly be competing with ourselves on outcomes-based funding. The funding required will be based on the outcomes we achieve. Um, so the dollars will go up or down based on our outcomes. So I think that that's a really critical piece is this is a, a dynamic formula. Uh, the other piece that, that I think is really important is in those smaller bullet points. We're not just counting traditional academic programs. This is going to be credentials of value, including degrees, certificates, and other credentials from credit and non-credit programs. The state is finally going to be recognizing in our funding model the breadth of what community colleges have been, have been doing across the state 
since our existence. And so I think there's a, there's a, a very exciting component to that, that there is a, a, there is a recognition of both the credit and non-credit programs. Uh, we're going to get, we're gonna get um, credit for our dual credit courses, and we're also going to get credit for students who transfer even without a degree. We, we know that we have about 17, 15 to 1800, somewhere in that, <laughs> 17, 15. yeah, 1500 to 1800 a year uh, that transfer to four-year institutions from Del Mar College without a degree. So we will get credit for those as well. So I think there's a real opportunity for, uh, for colleges uh, to tr be able to truly represent to the legislature uh, the successes that we have for the variety of students and for students who come to us with different, um, different choices of, around what they want to do and need to do in, in their higher education and post-secondary learning. So I'm just really thrilled that we were able to be a part of that. Yeah, that, that was another one, and I apologize for missing that one, but I'm glad you, you, you caught that one, Madam Chair, because that is a big one. You know, for Del Mar College for, for over 10 years has been a, a leader in that regard. Again, going out there and valuing what the community valued in terms of, 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 of asking from their college. You know, the, 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 the folks were out there saying, we just need short-term certificates. We just need this to get our foothold. And those short-term certificates, we've, we've been at the forefront of that conversation for a long while. Um, and so now, uh, of course, when I was on the, the, the lead, on, as lead of the workforce uh, portion of this, of this commission, um, you can bet that I was hooping and hollering. And I also had Dr. Brenda Case, president of Kilgore College, who, who's very aggressive with, with CE as well, um, helping me with all this. And so I've got to give a shout out to my colleague there. I call her my, Brenda, my sister Brenda over there. And, and so for the state to see credit and CE, and we can't call it non-credit anymore. We're gonna, we're gonna, I'm also got the group, yeah, I'm getting those nods there, yeah. So we're getting, we're, we're working on a marketing, to a rebranding of non-credit because it turns people off really bad. Um, and so to, 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 to be, uh, their words, not mine, agnostic of the two in terms of finance and, 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 and recognizing and the like is a whole new sea change. And, and already, um, I, when I was talking about this, I was just, I'll just add this, Regents, when, when we were in New York the other day at the Trustees Conference, I was talking about this to other colleagues from other states. They were, they were getting all excited about, about our plan and a lot of people are watching the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. so, taking it back from our local conversation, from our teams to now nationwide conversations where people are asking, hey, we wanna be like Texas. What they really mean is they wanna be like Del Mar College. Thank you. <laughs> That's right, yay. <yeah. laughs> Questions, Con Regent Kelly. Okay, and I saw on there, or I thought I heard someone say, um, scholarship money for dual credit students. So now high school kids will get help with Yes, so there, there is a large, there's a quite a bit of discussion around uh, expanding dual credit opportunities throughout the state. Uh, urban schools have, and, and schools that are in close proximity to community colleges have stronger dual credit programs because of phys physical proximity. How do we expand dual credit opportunities to other high school students across the state? Um, and so there, the idea that the state would come in through a cooperative with TEA and the coordinating board to offer those scholarships. In order to be eligible for a scholarship, the college would have to agree to a maximum tuition rate um, so that the students then, would, so the state's not funding um, some exorbitant dual credit fee just because a local college wants to set an exorbitant dual credit fee. Uh, but there, so there would be a maximum tuition that would be allocated. Uh, but this would flow through the community colleges to the high school students. So it would be administered by the college, not the school districts? Correct. Okay. Correct. But with the, with the idea of expanding, and expanding both within the current, the current high schools that are offering dual credit, to expand to other students who can't afford it right now, but also expand the number of high schools throughout the state that can offer dual credit. That was all predicated on the idea and the understanding of all the completions of dual credit. Was the, the balance, there was an imbalance there of students of need who were actually receiving or accessing uh, dual credit less than students uh, who did not have the same economic needs. So it's, it's, it's a balancing, again, going towards a need-based 
thing. It, it, it'll balance. It's, not, it's, it's, it's currently imbalanced and it's designed to bring equilibrium to, to those populations. Well, and later this afternoon we're going to see our report on how many kids actually graduate from high school with college degrees or certifications mm -hmm. and how many accomplish it within a year or two. Right. Um, so we can certainly see the value of the program. Absolutely. Other comments or questions? Feel free to, when you, we'll send out the final report as soon as it's available and, and we know there's going to be a lot of discussion, as Dr. Escamilla said, uh, throughout the, um, the, the next six months, eight, eight months to get to the end of the legislative session. What the legislature does with it, how the bills are actually written, uh, I think it's going to be a series of bills, not one omnibus bill. We could be surprised by that, but uh, we do have to look at uh, the legislative process to make sure that in making the sausage, all of the ingredients that we want in it are still there at the end, <laughs> and things that we don't want in it are not added. <laughs> For those who, who like to use the analogy of the legislature's like making sausage. <laughs> All right. Uh, for those of us who attended the um, Association of Community College Trustees Annual Congress in New York, we have an opportunity to share uh, verbally uh, things that you have learned. If there are handouts or presentations that you would like distributed to your fellow colleagues, please get those to Delia and she'll e email them out to, to all of our trustees. But we have an opportunity for Bill and D Dr. Adami, myself, and uh, Mr. Garza to uh, share what we learned. Who wants to go first? Bill? I'll go first. Uh, and I want to start um, by congratulating our staff and faculty. I don't know how many sessions I sat through where one college or another is telling us about the innovative program or ideas that they've implemented and thinking, we already do that. Uh, and, and it happened over and over again. Um, so we need to congratulate ourselves and recognize how innovative we've already been. Um, now, one program that did catch my attention um, was in a presentation from Fox Valley Technical College. And they had a program called Strategic Investments. And I'm glad that Mary McQueen is here um, because it's, it, the way it was described, it sounds like how um, K through 12 foundations or are, are, are school districts use their foundations. Um, where faculty or even community partners, if they come up with an idea, an innovative idea, um, they can write a grant application and the college, now Fox Valley was using its reserve funds, which I'm not sure that I would recommend, um, but um, it would be like writing a grant to the college and saying, I could do this great program if I could get this piece of equipment or if I could do that. Um, and one of the ways they, the president sold it to us or described it to us is we recognize that not all good ideas come during the budget process. And so um, we've reserved funds aside um, for these grant applications um, for good ideas that happen during the year. Um, and and it, that's what the school districts do with their foundations. Um, and I thought that it, it's so simple, but what a great idea. It certainly would promote innovation and creativity among our faculty and our community partners. So that's, that's one program that did catch my attention. Thank you. Who's next? Dr. Adami. You know, when, when you attend these conferences, you, you want to make it a point uh, to ask these questions. You know, what will we walk away with? How can we implement? some of the ideas that are out there. And, you know, it comes down to, you know, the students always first. And so, again, uh, just echoing what uh, my colleague was, uh, what was saying, Del Mar College is in the forefront of a lot of uh, these um, clinics and, and um, um, seminars that we've been attending. And again, you know, I'd like to congratulate Mark and, uh, and the staff and administration to taking it up to the next level. So we, we try to, it's always, it's always a, a great um, opportunity to meet other trustees, 
talk to them, listen to ideas, and have an opportunity of meeting the new president of, of, a, of a cat. And, um, and so, um, you know, uh, these ideas on pathways and diversity, you know, inclusion, uh, they're, they're, they're always important that um, we need to take away with us all the time and, um, and see how we can, as a group, you know, get together with other board members and, and see how we could take this up to the next level. So, um, Madam, that's all I have. Thank you. Mr. Garza? First off, I also want to thank the staff and thank Dr. Scamilla and, and uh, the board for allowing us to, to attend these, these conferences and these workshops. And they're, they're invaluable. I attended a uh, few workshops, and one that particularly piqued my interest was the strategies for increasing enrollment across the country. Everyone talks about enrollment numbers being pre-COVID-19 or 2019 uh, school year. And so everybody is trying to get to reach that level. Uh, it talked about dual credit, and of course, all colleges or just, just about every community college has a dual credit program that feeds into or works all the way down into their, into their high school. But then you also have opportunities, or we have opportunities to be able to look for ways to take and expand our recruiting efforts into type of a receiver. Our people need to be not just recruiters, but also receivers. When you're able to get the, those students from the dual credit programs into your facilities, into your campuses, trying to get them to be receivers so that they actually help them through the process so they feel comfortable being at Del Mar, uh, registering at Del Mar, uh, figuring out what classes to take and the like. Uh, they talked about creating communication plan for, for dual credit students uh, to include the parents, the counselors, and the faculty in the high schools. Um, strategy two is identifying low-hanging fruit. Uh, need to look at the programs or the areas in your community. Sir, we do, and I'm encouraged by what we're doing with, the, with our workforce partners and, and looking for, uh, I'm going to say, uh, quick-term certificates so that the, we can meet the needs of, the, uh, of industry and, and, and the... Uh, the jobs that we have in our community and preparing our young people for that's what they see a value in coming to Del Mar. But uh, Madam Chair, you talked about upskilling and, and, uh, and um, shoot, I can't even remember my own writing sometimes. <laughs> anyway, uh, one of the things that they talked about was besides the certificates and the CTE programs we, uh, CED programs that, uh, that we have coming up with programs for digital, digital certification. A lot of students that are doing remote learning, how do you figure a way to get, get them the, the, the credentials that they deserve and that they're going to need in order to enter a workforce and get a job that they're equipped to be able to handle? Um, that's certainly um, an opportunity that we've got. I think we're probably already working some of, some of those things, but I know I think that that's an area where we need to, to, to continue to invest in. Um, I know we've talked about building team, recruiting team. I still believe that there's opportunities because so many of our students that don't, that I'm going to say would be, should be our niche for Del Mar, uh, I don't believe we're reaching out strongly enough. Those are the students that you could work, get into, into certificate type programs and then getting them into uh, academic or continuing education programs. And particularly in the high schools, Miller, Moody, West Oso, most of those students are not of economic means in order to, to consider a college as, a, as an option after high school. And we need to figure out how we can get those students to think early on about, about attaining higher education. And so those are some of the things that, that I heard or listened to about strategies for increasing enrollment. One of the other things that I thought that kind of tied into the things that we've talked about related to the shifts that are happening at the state level is that we listened, Carol and I attended a luncheon, mm -hmm. and we listened to a Arthur Levine. He's an author of The Great Upheaval in Higher Education. And he was talking about the fact that education as we know it 
when I mean, we're used to looking and considering higher education is all the uh, brick and mortar, the four year experience or the dormitory experience or the athletic experience. But in reality, how are you gonna serve those students that want, so to speak, a quick fix, get that certification, get out there in the workforce and get into work and start earning so that they can take care of and improve the, the, the position of their families. And there's gonna be a huge, huge move in that direction. So I believe that it's gonna be critical that we invest in technology, both investing in the tools that it's gonna take in order to get us at the forefront of what technology is being used in order to be able to help those and, and help those students that are gonna learn from a remote standpoint. You still need the campuses in order to take care of the masses and those people that are used to being handheld and, 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 and talked through and shown every example. But you've got a lot of students that feel a lot more comfortable with the handheld devices and the laptops and than are than are able to, to, to gain from the from the social experience that a college offers. And I think that those are gonna be the big competitors that we're gonna be facing as a community college. You might wanna talk a little bit about that, if, Carol, if you... Absolutely, I'll, I'll piggyback, because that was oh, actually sure. one of the sessions I was gonna talk about as well. Uh, Dr. Levine's uh, luncheon presentation was really eye-opening, and, um, and just I'm gonna try to give you just a couple of bullet points that, that I took notes on. Um, that when you move from a fixed time, fixed content model to an outcomes-based model, potentially in funding, but what, what our digital age now has, has required of higher education, um, then the dominance for degrees will actually decrease and just-in-time education will increase. So the concept that this automation, this potential 24-hour access, how much requires uh, some sort of moderated learning environment versus uh, a self-learning environment. So there's, there's this big shift happening in education and that our biggest competitors are not necessarily other uh, higher education institutions but their online content like Coursera and Google and others. Um, he was giving an example, even museums are now offering masters and doctoral programs in specific areas. So the, the, it's, it's not traditional education or for-profit, which used to be our big competitors, it's now these other competitors in the field as well. And that outcomes are source, diag are source agnostic outcomes or source agnostic. When a student wants to learn something, then they want to go seek out the most efficient and effective way to learn that thing, that skill, that knowledge, whatever it may be. So it's a really interesting concept to think about. Again, his name is Arthur Levine and the book is The Great Upheaval. The other thing that, that I thought was very interesting um, is some statistics projections. Today, only 18% of students in higher education are full-time, residential, and 18 to 24. Only 18% of students in higher education represent what we all think of as the 18-year-old college freshman who's going away to university and is gonna live in a dorm. That's, that, that really is, just doesn't exist anymore. And so, their colleges are gonna to have to really look at this new model and who our new students potentially are going to be. Um, so I think the, the other takeaway was, who do we want our customers or our students to be? Talk to the students you want, recruit the students you want, because tomorrow will not be a repeat of yesterday. So those are some of the things that really jumped out at me about Mr. Levine's presentation. Um, uh, the other one I wanted to talk about was a presentation from Parkland College on leadership development and succession planning. Now they have a very robust leadership development program that was developed, uh, really has been in place since the early 2000s. So they've got 20 years of history. But they are doing, uh, they're identifying future leaders from all aspects of the campus. 
uh, recognizing those who are volunteering for, info for informal leadership positions, those who are looking at, who have positive, enthusiastic attitudes, those who are showing competencies or who are, who are collaborative in, in the work that they're currently doing. And they do, think, they do a variety of things. But they have a leadership conference for these emerging leaders uh, that's a three-day off-campus, really kind of out-of-town retreat. They say just far enough away that everybody can drive, but not, but far enough that uh, you don't drive home at night because you want everybody to be <laughs> sequestered for a couple of nights so that you can really get that, that networking opportunity as well. They look at opportunities from ACCT and AACC programs and others like Aspen Institute, Future Leaders uh, Institutes. They look at the National Institute for Staff and Organizational Development, and they also look at the Chair Academy for Training Future Department Chairs, things that I know you all know, but were, some of those acronyms were new to me. Uh, and so that really kind of structured environment around identifying and then training future leaders and then giving them opportunities to work within, um, within the college has been very fruitful. The return on investment for that particular college, since 2000, they've had 12 deans, six associate VPs, 11 VPs, and four presidents. Not all of those leaders are still at Parkland College. Some of them are at other colleges throughout the state. Uh, but that they have been really successful in developing their own group of uh, campus leadership through this program. So that was very interesting to me, and I'll type up those notes that make some sense to people who weren't in the session and, and pass those on to our regents as well. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, again, congratulations to the team and the, the words that you got, and I'm really, really encouraged by all the things that we've been doing, forward thinking, and trying to prepare our young people in order for them to get a job that's going to help their condition. But Dr. Levine left with one particular example. He said that the great one, uh, Wayne Gretzky, the hockey player, said that they asked him how he scored so many goals. And he said he doesn't skate to where the puck is. He skates to where he thinks the puck is going to be. We anticipate the puck buck is going to be in order to be able to, 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 to get there, to be able to do what, achieve what he's achieved. And so, again, think about hockey and think about how he, his, his mentality and where we think we're going to need to be in order to be successful in the future. So thank you. So I encourage you all to put um, the next Congress on your agenda. We've already got the dates for next year in Las Vegas. Um, and so we'll make sure that Delia gets those out so those of you who can m make an opportunity to attend and maybe try to plan, plan events around it, that'd be great if you could attend with us. So, Any questions? Any follow-up? Again, thank you all for the opportunity to attend. All right, moving into staff reports. Uh, we're going to uh, hear our... Um, I'm sorry, Dr. Escamilla, did you, you, you attended as well, you and Ms. Pettis, for their comments that you wanted to make. I apologize before we move uh, just, into the... No, I really had none, but it, since you asked, I mean, I, I think it's really critical um, that our regents go to these national conferences and uh, statewide conferences and the like, and I think the investment by the college is, is, um, is very important. Um, because because it's good for us to hear what we're not doing and it's also good as Regent Kelly said to hear what we are doing and we've heard that over the years and that's why I'm saying the more the merrier and and, and the like so I just want to thank you all for going and, and, and giving your very precious time um, traveling to New York City is not not easy I think Vegas is probably a little bit easier uh, probably a lot easier in a lot of ways but uh, uh, thank you all for doing that Thank that, you. Those are my comments. Our practice has always been for regents to be able to attend one of the two national co uh, conferences, either the uh, annual congress in October or the National Legislative Summit in February in Washington, D.C. And so uh, we look for an opportunity for our regents to be able to, to, to gain that exposure at those, that national level whenever you get a chance. All right. Sorry, um, Ms. Keyes and Mr. Culberson, but now we're going to hear our update. Ms. Keyes will introduce our guest for today. Yes, thank you very much, Regents. Uh, my pleasure today to introduce Mike Culberson, the Interim Chief, uh, Chief uh, Officer, CIO, CEO, <laughs> CEO of CCREDC, Corpus Christi Regional Economic Development Corporation today. He has a new title, so thank you, Mike. All right, thank you. Don't worry, I won't let it get to my head. Uh, 
<laughs> Madam Chair Regents, thank you, Dr. Escamilla, Dan, thank you uh, for having us here. Um, I want you to know that I, I, I come to the Mount uh, once a year for these things, but, uh, but we talk a lot. We talk a lot. We, uh, we talk a lot. We take a look at uh, Gulf Coast Growth Ventures, uh, the things that you do with uh, Vistalpina, with uh, Mary, with Dan. Uh, we, every time we talk to projects, and we talk to a lot of projects. Right now we have something like $17 billion worth of projects, and a lot of them are green. So most of them we're talking about making hydrogen. Uh, you'll hear ammonia. Don't, uh, the reason why we do ammonia is not for ammonia's sake, but we can add hydrogen for those who go over to the College of uh, Science, we'll find out. You can, you can put a hydrogen molecule, uh, hydrogen onto uh, ammonia and ship it quite easily. While hydrogen, moving hydrogen is, uh, can be uh, a little bit of a problem unless, unless you're uh, piping it for less than 25 miles. So uh, we, we, we interact with the college a lot. So, but let me talk to you about uh, some of the things we do. Um, when projects come in and we talk about tax abatements, and I know people go, ah, you know, you need to do this, but tax abatements are a way to better match expenses to revenues. When, when they're building these multi-billion dollar, you know, we, we don't, we think of, wow, billion dollar here, billion dollar there. We're 56 billion. If we were a state, we would be eight tied with Georgia. I mean, that's how, that's how much we do. This is how much, this is how important Del Mar is. This is how uh, important, you know, all of this land is. This is how important a port is. This is how important uh, three class one rails are. Uh, I don't know if you realize, but to get into Mexico, it's much, much easier to train it down by, to get it down by rail than it is to go into a port and then try to get into the interior of it. So we are, we are uniquely set for all of these things. And don't get me wrong, I know that we are, you know, we're not going to get uh, corporate headquarters, you know, because one of the first things when they come out with a thing, say, hey, we want an international airport within 45 minutes. Okay. We do have one, but that's not what they mean. So, you know. <laughs> but uh, anyway, and, you know, I like the airport. I'm on the airport board. I tried very hard not to be on it, but they, they said the CEO. So let's, uh, let me start going through this. Uh, we provide compliance for everybody. We provide for the city of Corpus Christi, both counties. Uh, we're nice. We're one of the few that are nice to all cities, counties, and, uh, and, and districts in there. Uh, we do where type A, uh, if you don't know, in Corpus Christi, in the city limits of Corpus Christi, we have uh, two incentive uh, sales tax. So it's one-eighth. Uh, we have four one-eighth. We have um, type A for seawall which is uh, up in 2025. Type A for the American Bank Center, they call it the Arena Fund, which is up in 2025. Type A for economic development, which a lot of uh, Del Mar, the uh, Northwest, uh, all of these have come through, and also with, um, with project te uh, process technologies and all of those have come through those and go through, and then uh, we also have another one, which is the Crime Control District, but then we, the type A for economic development expired and the voters replaced it with a type B, which is, makes it a lot easier. Uh, we use that for economic development and uh, affordable housing and streets. So that's how you get your streets part. So for type B, um, we, the EDC, does not only the compliance, but we do the application. So Mary sends me that and, and I'll say no and then I'll send it back and then she'll send it back and then she'll eventually stand on my desk and we'll find a way to get this thing done. But even with you and, and, you, know, and you know we love you, uh, we do compliance. We do all the compliance that is required. We look through, uh, I, I never really, so I'm a aerospace engineer. My degree is aerospace engineering. I have a, an MBA. I have I'm a CPA in the state of Texas, and I keep that up. So the importance of going through all of the agreements and making sure that they are, uh, they are measuring what you want measured. And so when we go through the agreements, we do IRS 940s, 941s. You're like, well, for those of you in business, you know that every quarter you have to supply the IRS with uh, 941s, which are quarterly reports that for payroll, and then 940s are your annual. Uh, there's a TWC report that actually has people where people live. And that's the important part. Now, if we say, if you say you're going to create 150 jobs and you have people and 
this happens all the time and when I was in with ABB it happened a lot we would have people in other cities and countries that are on your payroll and that's fine but they don't count toward that 150 everybody on that 150 has to live here and I make sure of that and I'm gonna retire next year and I'm changing my number so you know don't bother <laughs> don't bother calling okay. but but we'll have somebody else who does that, somebody who's smart like that and, and knows, knows this. Now, you know, you don't have to be really smart to look at TWC reports, but I mean, don't worry, they'll get all that. Um, we'll review all the assertions and then for, for um, Del Mar College ones, the ones that, that the regents have passed, we send, I send a, uh, an annual report to the president uh, for his review. And of course, I work with your attorney all the time, really, once we're happy, then we send the report to, uh, to your president. So right now we have, a, you have two that are still active. You have MNG, which of course is uh, now CC Polymers, and I'll show you real quick. So they were bought out of bankruptcy uh, from Alpac, which is like the, uh, one of the largest uh, ethane cracker uh, PET. So we have PET and PTA. So PET is... Uh, <laughs> I don't know, lost the name. Only yeah. terephthalate. Hey, turn on your mic and say something. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they also have a PTA plant. Okay, so um, Alpac is one of the largest in the world. In fact, that it had to go through the Federal Trade Commission to approve this buy. Uh, Indorama, which is out of Thailand, although they're an Indian company, uh, as in India, and Far Eastern out of, um, T, uh, out of uh, Taiwan. So they bought it. And they are going to mobilize. So they said they're going to do 751. Castleton was a great idea. It's just uh, they were bought and uh, they decided to go somewhere else. And Vistalpina Docks. Now, Vistalpina Docks, that was something that um, Lloyd Neal at, at, uh, at the county thought of. And what he wanted, there was the, there's been a, um, a lawsuit going on between the two counties is, you know, if I put a dock and it and extends into the line you know is that san patricio or is that once across the mean high tide mark is it is it now nueces county um i had a lawyer once ask me well mike if you built a uh, if you built a house on the uh, on the dividing line would you move the uh, the county property line and i said no he goes well so it shouldn't happen anyway it did happen and so <laughs> And so one of the reasons why you did the uh, Vistal Painted Docks was you didn't want them paying income ta uh, property tax if you had to refund it. Right now, the reason why there's a line through it is it is, it is uh, considered over in San Patricio and it's not counted on the, uh, on the appraisal district. In fact, if you go on the appraisal district and you type Vistal Pena, it'll show nothing. You have Epic Y grade. It says 200 million and 10 jobs, but uh, if you've been over there, you'll realize that and unbeknownst to us, I'll, I'll be honest, uh, they built a huge, I mean a huge crude facility over there. Um, and when the neighbors were up in arms, we were up there, we were up there with them, you know, because we don't want it either. We live here also. Um, and they did some things. There were some things they were, they were worried about. Said, hey, if you have a fire, we can't get out of here. So they paid for another road to get out of there um, and to go. So even though it's only 200 million, they actually have the crude facility, which is another 150 million, that probably would not have been here had you not approved that for the fractionating plant. So right now, just like I said, we have two of them. Um, MNG, let's, call it, let's say CC Polymers and make them feel good. They've mobilized. They're 750. Uh, right now, on the rolls, they're uh, 669. But they're thinking they're going to be 200 to 300 million more to get that done. So you will see even more come back to you. Uh, you got paid for, uh, for the uh, abatement uh, amendment that you had just done. So that was money that's, uh, I wouldn't say not expected, but now you have it in pocket. Uh, and then they, they still have to create the 200 jobs uh, going forward. So they are still looking for a uh, production start of, 200, of 2024, and Epic Y grade is uh, blowing and going. They're doing fine. They've did everything that they said they were going to do. And I want to talk to you real quick about why do we do incentives? We do incentives to incentivize people to make a decision to come here. 
And people go, well, why don't we get all of the money that if they came here, well, they wouldn't come here. I promise you they won't come here because there's state of Louisiana that's more than willing to pay a lot of money to get those. And there are a lot of other companies for, we'll, we'll say, we won't say the, uh, the word, but the one that has, has the big X's on, on the uh, service station, that the governor of Mississippi said he was going to be the project manager on that, the governor. So you, you want to talk about, you know, we're fighting for those things. And so the question isn't whether you're going to get 18 million or, or 24 million. It's whether you're going to get 18 million or 78,000. That's what these are. And once they're here, they're here for 50 years. Even when Sherwin went out of business, they had been here 50 years. This is what you are counting on. These are, and we talk to people all the time. I talked to, you know, when we were doing the Tesla deal for uh, down there now, and that's going to be a weird one I'll talk about in a second. You know, at, at Rothstein ISD, these create jobs that your kids can, that you can get trained on. Your kids can get it. They can buy a car. They can buy a house. They can get married. They can raise kids. They can have, they can have a family, and they could have a good life. I mean, think about it. We, we talk all about... And, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not a graduate of, uh, of Del Mar, but I've been, but I have 12 hours, so I'm pretty happy. <laughs> so, um, you know, we, we talk about that everybody needs a four-year degree. Well, in, in Corpus Christi, only 25, less than 25% have a bachelor's or above. So are we all going to write off the 75%? No, you aren't, thank God. You are not going to do that. You are going to give them jobs. You're going to give them training, whether it's just, you know, hey, swinging a hammer on, on, on how to be a carpenter, how to, how to do framing. You are going to save the, these kids. And a lot of these jobs are the exact kind of jobs where they can, have a, they can raise a family and they can do well. And that's what we need. And that's what we need in this area. We don't need kids leaving. I left here in uh, 1975. The uh, going across the Harbor Bridge, and I don't know if you remember, but the inmates used to stand on the fourth floor of the thing and wave outside the bars. Yeah, it said 254,000 pulled into Austin. Said 218,000. We came back. My wife wanted to come back. 2005, we came in 277,000. I I don't remember how much Austin is, but it seems bigger. It seems <laughs> seems bigger. I'm just saying, and. It's kids that we're losing. It's not people like me. You know, it's, well, I'm a boomerang, actually. But it's, it's kids that we're losing, and it, and it just becomes a very, very big deal. And these are the types of things that you can do that can affect it. And not only that, we know that you will sit there with us at the table and you say, well, you know what? We'll make a, uh, we'll, we'll make a process technology curriculum so that you will have people. And those are very, very important to us. So let me talk really quickly about, uh, yep, I lost it. Thank you. Okay, so let me talk really quickly about Tesla. The, uh, uh, they have a 313 uh, application pending before the comptroller's office. I'm sure there's a guy named Greg who's sitting up in uh, Austin who's kind of probably took it and put it at the top of the pile. I, I, don't, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't doubt that. Um, now they know that Del Mar grows by school district. And they know that you are on the ballot in November. And they know that if that ballot passes, that they will be in your, and they have not asked for anything, nor have we offered. So uh, th those are all known. So that's about 400 million, uh, 150 jobs. So I want you to know that you're very important to us, to the community, and to how we attract uh, companies. Uh, you're very important about when you decide to forego some short-term uh, tax benefits for long-term tax uh, growth and jobs. And I want you to know that when you put one in order, that there is somebody who goes in every year and checks and makes sure that they are in compliance and doesn't just kind of move over and just say, hey, thanks for being here. You know, we don't care. All right. Thank you very much. Any questions? Questions for Mr. Culverson. Mr. Kelly? 
Yeah, I, I want to let you know that we now have guided pathways, and we can get you a counselor to turn those 12 hours <laughs> into <laughs> a certificate or a degree. All right. <laughs> give, me, give me something to do in my uh, third career. Well, I was, I was showing him that outdoor kitchen right out the window there, so he may have to come back for a culinary uh, arts degree. Yeah, my <laughs> wife would like me to come. <laughs> I'd just like to make the comment in, in response, uh, Mike. First of all, thanks for being here, as always. Uh, you've been, a, uh, even though you're retired, what did you say, 10 more years? Yeah, uh, yeah. August, next August. That's next August. Okay. I'm not even going to be here next year. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I want to thank you for, for all the work that you've done. You've been a great friend and colleague here for, for a lot of years. The 14 that I've been here and before that, I know. But I uh, want to thank you. The, 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 but your point about the diversification of the companies coming in. See, there's a debate out there, and, and I, I obviously have to be really, I am just inherently neutral about these kinds of things in, in, from my position. But bringing in abatements is so important now more than ever. So many folks, so many people in groups out there are against the abatements just unilaterally. And I'm saying now's the time to use them to diversify. Now's the time to bring in the blues and the green energies and all those other kinds of things to diversify what's already out there because those are probably um, some of the lower hanging fruit. I mean, we have examples of some of those coming. And I know they're in the minority at this point, but, mm. but if we can keep um, growing those opportunities and balancing out uh, the, 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 the petrochems and everything else and diversify and do everything we've been saying we've been, we needed to do for the past, well, since 1975, yeah. uh, in, 19, in 205 when you got back. Um, I think now is the time uh, to, to really keep that at the forefront of, the, of our discussion and, and to see how we can be a part of it. I know recently there was a school district across the bridge that voted no against the 313 and made a statement that way and okay, well, we, you, know, we, 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 you know, we live with it and we keep moving on. Um, it's no longer a one-sided argument. Right now, I think is time to, for us to um, either get your successor and or you while you're here to come back and really talk about what that diversification could look like. Um, and you can use all your code names and everything else that you have to uh, to, to protect uh, the projects. But, but, it, but bring us up to speed with that. I would ask that if you and someone or someone from the sure. EDC can, CCR EDC can, can, can bring us up to speed on how that diversification could look. Um, I think it would bring uh, more um, positive attention to these abatements and, and I, I, I don't know, I always like to stay at the forefront of those conversations. I don't want to be behind. So those and are my I'll, comments. I'll tell you what, what all of the uh, plant managers and HR people tell you. Uh, starting now, if it hadn't even already started 10 years ago, you have to be a lifelong learner. Your job may not may not be what it's going to, you know, it, we talk to the, the refineries and you have millwrights that have done millwright for 35 years, you know, that may not, it might not exist. What, what you start today may not exist 20 years from now, so you have to be a lifelong learner. And you help with that. Delmar helps with that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Culberson. The Thank question you. I have uh, for Ms. Keys and maybe Mr. Garcia, the, these uh, abatement agreements uh, phase in their, their zero during construction or for a, mid, for a maximum period of time and then they phase in at 10%, 20%, up to 100% uh, tax value. Um, so where are we with both of those CC Polymers and Epic Y grade ending in 2024? Are we, where are we in those, that, that step ladder? Okay, so in, uh, with CC Polymers, with the, with the abatement amendment, um, do you want to take that, Mr. Rivera? Because you had changed from a, from a percentage to actual, this is a minimum that you have to hit. And then for, uh, for Epic, it, uh, you are through the 100%, uh, in other words, not getting any, and so now you're into the 50%, and Epic does not go all the way out to 10 years. It can go out to 10 years, but, uh, but it does not because of, of where, it's, where it's set in the thing. And I think it's 100% uh, for two years or construction, so if they were to finish early, then it would stop. And then 50% um, for five years? Epic. Do you remember Epic? I don't remember it off the top of my head. If you can make a note next year when we do okay. this to, to think about where we are with those two agreements, because I think it would be important to understand where we are in that, in that because I know they were tiered, and right. just understanding where we are in that tiered yes, process would be helpful for okay. next year. I'll get that to you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you very much, Mr. Culverson, for being here. We appreciate it. Any other questions or comments? 
All right, we will move into our enrollment update. Dr. Escamilla, do you want to start that conversation while Ms. Benavides Dominguez and Ms. Keyes come up? I'm, I'm going to wait to the end of the, All right. of the pr presentation. Thank you. Good morning. I mean, good afternoon, Madam Chair, Board of Regents. Today, we're going to review the student enrollment report data for 2020-2021. Uh, an overview of enrollment is what we're going to share with you today begins with the explanation of the state uh, Texas biennium base year for contact hours, formula funding, head count, contact hours, dual credit, then ending with an annual update contact hours for the fall and spring semesters, continuing education, corporate services, and some retention metrics. And I'm going to hand it over to my colleague Lenore. Thank you very much. Uh, as we all know, the legislature pays us on an annual or semi-annual, two years, every two years biennium, a, a base year. And the base year starts with an even number year starting in what we define as the summer one semester. What's significant here is that summer one is defined as anything that comes after the first 16 week term in, Jan in spring which is January. So anyone that enrolled in February, March, or any of those other subsequent semesters, which we have 16 week, 15 week, 14 week, eight week, May semesters, anyone that enrolls in those other semesters is considered summer one. And so those counted for the 22, uh, 23 biennium, which is coming up, which is the legislature would determine now, which is what we get paid for in the next time. This is the base year calendar. And if you notice, we have two different sets here. One is for credit, and the other is for continuing education. Credit is a course on the semester and summer terms. And this shows how it began for uh, in the base year of 22 to 23, would be, begin paying out in February of next year, or, or begins in August of next year and started in February uh, for 22 as it moves forward. We right now are in quarter one for the continuing education. This is showing our revenues and how the pie chart works out for this uh, budget year right now. We want to focus on the state appropriations, and this is what we're going to refer to in this enrollment report. State appropriations based on contact hours presently is approximately 15% of our total $114,706,000 budget, operating budget. However, we do receive an additional 5% of our budget to go towards uh, benefits, state benefits. This is showing our base year funding as it presently exists for the base year biennium of 22-23. Of course, those dollars were earned during 2021. Uh, is what we're being funded on presently. And this is how we come up with the over $17 million, which is comprised, of course, of our contact hour funding, our credit hour funding, which we receive from continuing education and credit, and then our student success formula, and then your base or your core operations amount that every uh, college or university gets, college gets. Uh, I was going to next time I'll ask Dr. Esme, we wanted to talk about this here, is that this may be changing as we move forward in this legislative session. Uh, as, as we just had the comments and the uh, overview on what the work of the commission on state funding, this could change. Uh, if this were to go from the contact hour portion that you see here in blue and come, become outcome-based, we don't know exactly what that would mean. And if we don't know what the legislature will do However, we do know that there's a lot of work going towards that right now as we roll into the new legislative session. So this is, this is potentially going to change. We've actually had the discussion that we're going to have to continue to do our counts this way and be prepared mm -hmm. in case there's a bottleneck and the legislation doesn't pass, then we'll, be, we'll still be doing this for another two years. It is our hope that there will be a new funding model and in, in, in the midst of that, we will be part of what was passed at the commission level was a recommendation that there be a temporary hold harmless 
so that no college would fall behind as we transition to this new, or would lose funding, I should say, not fall behind, but would lose funding. So we would have to still calculate what would our funding be based on the, the old model, and if we would be potentially one of the colleges that might lose funding because of the new formula, we would have some sort of temporary hold harmless for a year or two, three, whatever the, the number would be. But there's, so there, we'll have to continue with these calculations for the short term while we're thinking about how the, the new calculations might work. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. That, and that's exactly where we are and with the new commission work that's coming out. And so, but this gives you an example of how the funding has come over the last many, many years on the biennium basis. Patricia. This slide shows how formula funding has changed over time and what the rate will be for 22-23. The success point rate will be 200 and, oh dang, I read the wrong thing. Oh, Arch, I'm ahead of myself, I'm sorry. Uh, we always like to compare ourselves where we are in relation to our large uh, college peers group. This slide shows the funding in each category, as you see there. Yes. Look, look, go back to that one real quick. Just look at the proportions on the, this last, second to last column right here mm -hmm. to see how far ahead we are. Contact our funding. Contact an hour, contact hour for continuing education to just show you the volume of work that we've been doing there and putting that in there. That, that drew the attention of a lot of people in Austin. And it, well, it was no accident that it, I think I was put on as lead of the workforce group and the, and, and the like. Um, those numbers just go back and, sh and reflect a lot of hard work, a lot of hard work by our staff. But that'll pay off. That'll balance things out as we move ahead. Thanks, Patricia. This slide shows how formula funding uh, has changed over time and what the rate will be for 22-23. The student success point rate will be $264.78. The slide shows the base year funding for each biennium beginning with 2018-2019 to current year. The funding shows we are down in credit uh, contact hours by 3% and up 35.9% in CE contact hours. When you combine the two, we're slightly up. Yeah, thank you, Patricia. I wanted to reiterate what Dr. Escamilla just said. The significance here is if you take the swing between uh, Del Mar College at up 35, almost 36% in continuing education contact hours, compared to the community colleges statewide, which were down almost 38%. That's a huge, huge swing. And another reason that we were seen uh, and got a lot of attention. Well, so what does that actually mean in terms of the, 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 the question? That's a rhetorical question. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it means that the, that the college is reacting to the community and responding to the community. And so where people call, people say that there's a, a downward trend in enrollment, I don't see it that way if we're keeping all, making all students equal. It's a shift. They're moving from traditional age to less traditional age, but they're, they're, they're still students. They, they, they haven't changed. They're still people, right? But um, people don't, colleges don't see it that way. The state is starting to see that see it that way when the commissioner of higher ed is saying is changing his vocabulary and frankly building his vocabulary uh, because he's been a university centric person and focused person for a long time and all good this was our opportunity and so now um, the language at the coordinating board and the infrastructure the the data and information that the infra, at the, at, that's being stored at the, the coordinating board is now changing and actually being built from the ground up to support these set data sets. It's really, really interesting. Well, I, I think I'd like to tie this back to what Mr. Culberson was just talking about and the relationship that's happened here within, with what the college has been able to do with forward thinking in these areas to meet that demand. 
that's out there in the workforce. Student success funding. This graph is a review of how colleges review student success points. Uh, Texas Community College receives uh, points after a student reaches certain milestones, such as completing developmental work, completing 15, 30 hours of credit, and earning a credential. This is our annual weighted success points total. We always like to compare ourselves to our peer group. This chart compares Del Mar College to other large colleges across the state. It shows we are at with regard to success points. Del Mar College in 2019-2020 success point total was 16,753, which is flat in comparison to our 2018-2019 and down 5% from 2017-2018. We fall in the middle in this peer group. Spring credit headcount. This slide is our uh, state reported data for spring credit uh, headcount and includes flex uh, data entry. The slide shows the enrollment struggles we are experiencing due to the pandemic and the inflation, which we are still addressing today. We continue to focus on increasing second eight weeks, which has added uh, to our flex uh, data point in our CBM count. The college experienced a dip in enrollment in spring 22, which is down 15%. Uh, fall credit headcount. This bar graph provides a fall historical headcount beginning with fall 2018 to current and shows a steady decline. As you can see, we are down 6.4% for fall 22. Summer, uh, this slide is a review of our headcount for summer one. We certified 49.89, uh, which we were up 10%. Uh, the data uh, from, uh, in comparison to summer 21, you can see that the flex enrollment assisted in our uh, certified data, which goes to point, we've been doing a lot of emphasis on the, on the flex, flex semesters. Summer two, in review of our headcount of summer two, we certified 3355, uh, which we were down 10% for summer in comparison to, to summer 21. Credit contact hours. This bar graph provides a historical perspective of our credit contact hour overview from 2017 to 2018 to current year. The chart illustrates a steady increase in contact hours for the first three academic years. And in the last two years, we have a slight decline as a result of the ongoing pandemic. Dual credit. Uh, the dual credit program continues to grow. Although from fall 20 to fall 21, enrollment took a slight dip. Overall, this slide shows that we've been at a 5% increase uh, with 16.5%. Uh, we currently have 35 high schools participating in the dual credit program. We're in nine counties uh, in our service area, and we, current, and we continually strive to uh, strengthen our ISD uh, partnerships. Continuing education, Lenore? As you see here, uh, the continuing trend for continuing education. This is an annual head count. Many of our students are taking multiple courses. Uh, however, this is a solid head count for 21-22. And when you look at your annualized enrollment, you have over 13,000 students who've come to us in continuing education. I'd like to state that during the pandemic, uh, where we, for 2021 and 2122, is very solid numbers over the year 1920. Our transportation services are a CDL program, and our health programs really continued and, the, and really outshone the rest of the state as far as total enrollments. 
And this is your total contact hours for credit and continuing education, which I think you can see the combined impact as to how the two combine together to give us a standard trend. And these also combine to provide contact hour reimbursement or funding from the state of Texas. We continue to promote registration and leverage the HERF programs funds to assist with enrollment and continue to work with our partners to stimulate enrollment and many of the activities that have gone on through uh, the student advising and student affairs office have leveled us out during the pandemic years. Patricia. This slide uh, shows uh, the fall 21 to fall 22 enrollment percentages of our cohort colleges across the state. Del Mar has experienced uh, a 6.44 decline uh, from fall 21 to fall 22. The cohort ranges uh, from 6.44 to uh, positive 5.66. Dual credit. This slide is a relatively new data point that we are monitoring. Dual credit students are monitored annually to see how many are earning a credential by high school graduation, how many earn, uh, how many enroll at Delmar College upon completing high school, and how many earn a degree within one year of completing high school. As you can see here, uh, from the cohort of 2021, we had 1,220 seniors, which was 9.3% uh, uh, earning a credential, 28.4% enrolled at Del Mar College, and 13.1% earned a credential within one year of completing high school. We attribute this to the, um, this uh, metric with our enrollment staff, our faculty, our ISD partners, encouraging students to finish the program that they started in high school. Intrusive advising and outreach practices with students starts early on in the freshman year. And it truly is, uh, it's a, I don't know how to say it, but a controlled chaos situation where we are handing off, we have the dual credit advisors, enrollment advisors, uh, faculty that are teaching at the high school, all working with these students. And we do track these students and we do pass this information to our ISD partners so that they know how many of their students are earning a credential while they're there because they're interested in the CCMR points and also how many of them are earning it upon high school graduation. This chart demonstrates the fall to fall retention beginning with fall 17 to current year. And this chart is the same information as the previous slide, but comparing it to uh, Texas Community Colleges. And as you can see, the metrics are, are pretty uh, the same. Do we have any questions? Questions? Dr. Escamilla, you had comments? Uh, two, two slides back, maybe three. One more. Yes. So we've been talking about this, uh, talking about the number of students matricul matriculating to uh, to Del Mar after dual credit. That's what that this column is, right? Uh -huh. Yes. Sir. That number, I think, is a, a very strong number compared to to statewide data. Do you have any indication? The any state comparison? does not. Uh, the state. This is not uh, uh, that I'm aware of. Uh, that we, that this is tracked by uh, co-board. This is something that we're tracking. We've brought it up. I brought it up in state meetings and so forth. And, and I know Regent Kelly, you asked about that some some time ago. Um, but anywhere in the, in the in that range right there, the percentage-wise is a is a strong indicator of of, um, of dual credit being um, a, a strong and powerful tool to bring them bring them to the college. Of course. Lots of drivers, um, lots of reasons why, price of university and that kind of thing. And we should see those numbers going up as we can accommodate students who now can't afford the tuition for dual that, credit. That was exactly my, my next point. You read my mind. And, and that that number, we need to watch this number very closely because if the state is going to get behind uh, our students uh, with the commission 
redoing the, the financing of, of and making that a metric and or excuse me making that a, a priority of funding students with need um, and preparing them I think there's going to be some more well stay tuned with this number is what I'm saying I'm trying to make connect those dots with the new new way of, of funding in this metric Patricia so we we'll just need to keep an eye out sure will. stay tuned question yes sir along the same along the same lines dual credit um, just a question uh, since there's different new information coming out about what the state's going to be coming coming along to help with uh, funding for dual credit do we have someone that actually visits the campuses or if we see a drop-off in dual credit graduate uh, students from a particular ISD or particular school do we have someone that actually I'm, I'm just kind of wondering it within myself are we people dependent? I mean, are we dependent on a teacher, I mean, excuse me, a counselor, or a principal, or some administrator being a fan of dual credit? Or do we have a process that says we go in, we kind of give them all the tools, all the benefits, and, and, then, and then hope to... It's all those things. It's our relationship with each uh, high school, and, uh, you know, some relationships, uh, you know, I wouldn't say are stronger than others, but there's some schools that I would say do it better than other schools, right? And sometimes, you know, every year we have to re-educate the staff because there's staff turnover. There may be a yeah. new principal, a new high school counselor to educate on, you know, what do we have available with dual credit. And so, yes, we, we, those metrics we do share with them every month, our, our sometimes more than once a month, our, our uh, dual credit advisors are out there at the schools, pounding the pavement, uh, talking with uh, supers, talking with the principal, talking with counselors, parents, students. Uh, we have parent nights. As a matter of fact, uh, on April 17th, we're inviting counselors here to this campus to, to do a tour. Uh, and we're doing uh, some strategic uh, invites to counselors and uh, ISD board members to come and look at our facilities. We have changed so much, all, all our infrastructures uh, on every campus so that we can tell them, this is what we have. This is what it looks like. So we, uh, so we, uh, we do have uh, strategic events throughout the year inviting um, people to come from those, from those ISDs. Patricia. And we do share the metrics with them because I love competition. I love for them to see what ev everyone else is doing. Patricia, how many people do we have over there with Bob? We have four. Yeah. And then the, they're not the only four, but they are going from place to place in college, uh, a dual credit night to dual credit night to dual credit night. Um, and I, I would invite everybody to, if you, if you do social media, to go, there are different departments within Del Mar College. Mm -hmm. So there are multiple um, groups within and, and Dual credit is one, it's continuing ed is another, and there's different little things. You'll see the events that way. Otherwise, yeah. you won't really know that the, those things are going on. And many of the dual credit students are CE students. So, you know, we are constantly working to make sure, okay, this student's a senior. How are we taking care of them? I know uh, this week uh, on Monday, we had our dual credit advisors out at the high school registering students for spring registration. So. Okay, I just... I think sometimes if you have a, a dual credit champion at the high schools or at the ISDs, right? Oh, yeah. That, that's critical for, to the success of your program. And then if that champion retires or transfers or something, then you've got to have a way of recognizing that you've got to go back in and, mm -hmm. and develop some, somebody new, a new champion. Well, right. the built-in metric for the, for the ISD is at CCMR. So, you know, that it's a win-win. You know, they want the CCMR point. We want them to earn a credential. And so that's what unites us, I think. Yep. And if you, if you see, if you get a chance, Regent Garcia, to see, and one of the most recent ones was London ISD that I saw. The, the cafeteria was almost standing room only with the parents there. You'll see what the power of the team actually does high school by high school by high school on every dual credit night. And invariably, whenever you have one, I get a phone call from somebody saying, hey, I need you to help me with so-and-so. I mean, it, 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 we're so closely tied to the community. It is a, it is a, um, 
um, it, it's a community-based effort, and and I I would I don't know how I can get you to I'll I'll I'll, I'll shoot you some slides and so forth. If you you what I I know you want to visualize you haven't seen. It doesn't sound like, um, but I, I want you to see what those uh, cafeterias look like when they're full of parents and, and, and right next to their students. Mm -hmm. um, and and recently, I think it was like last week, Davis and uh, Dean Shramick were at the new Carroll High School uh, working with our uh, ISD Carroll partners on uh, curriculum and bringing students in. Thank you very much uh, for that presentation. We appreciate the detail. Uh, next up, we have our HERF update. Mr. Garcia is going to talk to us about the Higher Education Emergency Relief Fund. Oh, wait, Lenora is going to start. <laughs> I'm going right. to kick us off. Yes, thank you. The college received over $30.8 million due to COVID pandemic and the resulting Higher Education Emergency Relief Funding. This update will show you how the funds from HERF 2 and 3 were allocated and distributed to support student and operational initiatives. Over 52% of the funds went towards student support. The remaining 48% was distributed to address operations, technology, and health-related needs of the college due to the COVID pandemic. The following provides specific information on these various strategies and now uh, Mr. Garcia. <laughs> Thank you, Lenora. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Mr. President, and members of the board. Uh, just a, a little bit more of a, a backdrop to today's presentation. So uh, the college delivered uh, the first higher education relief uh, funding uh, for two and three uh, back in April of 2021. And so we have since then delivered multiple updates describing the rigid financial compliance requirements uh, of the grant, our spending plan, and uh, have introduced our HERF uh, committee. And so uh, we're gonna go ahead and start off with the first slide. Uh, so this first slide represents our initial spending plan on uh, the combined HERF grants valued at uh, $30.8 million. One takeaway from this slide uh, is that, uh, as uh, my colleague mentioned, that over 50% of the grant has been set aside for student financial aid assistance, uh, retention and re-engagement initiatives. Uh, this includes here on this slide the emergency and student success initiatives valued at 11.5 million and uh, the 4.6 million uh, respectively. This is on top of the already $18 million that we provide to our students in federal financial aid on an annual basis. The remaining allocation of funds uh, went towards uh, defraying asso uh, expenses associated with the pandemic, including lost revenues, technology costs uh, associated with a transition to distant education, uh, creating a health and safety environment for our students and our employees, and training for faculty and staff. Fast forward today, we are near the end of the grant and on track with spending the full amount of the grant by June 30th. Today's financial figures are fluid because of the pending commitments and encumbrances. Our final financial reporting of grants spend will be completed by May or June of 2023. Uh, if there are no questions on this slide, uh, my colleague Patricia Benavides Dominguez, Vice President of Student Affairs, will provide further details of our spending plan for direct emergency awards uh, to our students valued at $11.5 million. I already spent almost all of it. <laughs> so uh, uh, this slide is an overview of how we have allocated her funding uh, directly to the student. The requirement from uh, Department of Ed stated that we had to award directly to the student. And this shows how uh, awards were dispersed. So you can see how you know the awards by term for funds awarded, average award, and students assisted. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, so, uh, Ms. Benavides, uh, Benavides Dominguez just completed her presentation on uh, one of three uh, tranches uh, to our HERF grant funding. 
And we are now going to turn our attention to the next two tranches uh, valued at $19.3 million. Uh, members of the uh, advisory committee will also provide spending updates uh, for the other uh, uh, activities that I mentioned earlier. So here we go, lost revenues. Uh, the grant provided funding for lost revenues caused by the pandemic uh, with a reported value. Uh, we have billed the grant close to $3.9 million. Uh, this includes or is it related to the tuition and fees, uh, revenues as well as food services and child care. Uh, I will now ask uh, Ms. Tammy McDonald to provide an update to our vaccination program. Thank you. In the fall of 2021, the college implemented a COVID-19 voluntary vaccination incentive program for employees and students. We had approximately 706 employees that participated and they received a one-time incentive payment of a net of $200. And we had one student short of 4,000, so we had 3,999 students participate and they received a one-time incentive of a $200 gift card. So our total spend um, for this program was a little bit over $1 million, and we felt that it was very successful. Thank you. The Success Outreach Plan. Uh, student Services was allotted $4.6 million to spend on students. We've spent $2.2 million and have $2.4 million to go. As you can see by the pie chart, we are strategic on where we spend the money, for example, we have utilized her funds to eliminate student debt, student debt since spring 20. We've been utilizing uh, that. So far, we have cleared $675,825, which is about approximately 31% of the her funds. Um, there are additional uh, talking points there that we have uh, expended the dollars but I just took out uh, student debt as, as one talking point. Uh, this past uh, fall, we uh, did the campaign uh, that I'll go over in the next slide on uh, fall, uh, second eight weeks out of class. That was one of the campaigns that we, we did. So on the HERF campaign timeline, this slide represents the HERF dollars spent in support of marketing student-focused financial aid campaigns. The funds for you ran uh, summer 2021 during July and August to promote fall 21 enrollment. The add a class uh, ran at the end of 2021 and through the first of 2022 in support of spring 22 enrollment. And the tag you're in ran summer 22 to promote second summer session and fall uh, 2022 enrollment. Uh, the 800 on us is the one that we just recently had that was promoting the second eight week uh, fall 22 enrollment. Uh, these campaigns have been on TV, radio, digital, social media, streaming services, print and billboards. Collectively, these campaigns have had over 4 million impressions to our residents in Corpus Christi and the surrounding areas. And they also delivered over 20,000 unique visits to our website. I have a question about these campaigns. Mm -hmm. So of the 989,000 spent, that's, that's spent on the campaigns or the, because those numbers don't add up with what you right. talk about. So tell me, I'm trying to fresh, understand that's, the numbers. That's uh, on the marketing. Gotcha. That's what we spent on, on all those, all those uh, um, billboards, radio spots, social media. Uh, we established FAQs on the website, print ads, postcards, and uh, establishing the online HERF application. And so how many students then are we talking about the combined, those four combined campaigns reached? Well, uh, I don't have that figure, but uh, on the, the student debt amount for that figure, we helped 1,666 students. That is duplicated. I don't have the amounts for all the campaigns, but I could get that to you. So as opposed to impressions, I think the real result is how many students actually applied and utilized those funds. 
mm -hmm. and what are we learning about those students? What, what triggers them to act? Uh, is it the same students taking advantage of several programs in a row? Or are these all unique students? I'm just curious as to what we're learning about these campaigns and, mm -hmm. and how we can use that to, to better our our marketing and our enrollment in the future. On slide four, you can see the number of students assisted by term. So you'll be able to see that and the average award and uh, the funds expended in each term. So that, that gives you... But we don't know if those are directly related to those campaigns. Are they all directly related to those campaigns or...? Most of them are, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's the correlation is yes. that... And all right. With the exception of the, uh, when we first started uh, in the spring of 20, we had to expend that money right off the way. We did batch awarding based on need. That was the HERF 2. So in, the CARES. in spring of 20. Yeah, I don't have that on there. I'm so sorry. So we don't have a spring 22 camp. Well, I guess that's at a class. So the spring 22 would, it would be at a class. Right. And that resulted in 5,600 students that were, that doesn't make sense. Because your direct student numbers is who you gave money to out of the direct emergency system. I'm trying to figure out how many people actually enrolled as a result of these campaigns. The, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I don't think we can do a direct correlation. I, right. I think there were multiple touch points uh, on our marketing uh, campaign, uh, but this is the results uh, of, of the students that uh, we assisted using HERF money. Right, and, but that's separate from right. these campaigns. So somebody could get money from the assistance program and get this tuition assistance grant? They're related. They're related, yes. Right. They're related. But it could very well be that the campaign, those folks they were interested may not have qualified, but still got enrolled to the college. That's the number that I'm not too sure we're able to get our arms around. So overall, yes, we made a campaign. These are the uh, numbers of uh, students that we assisted, but there's also that other factor that we just can't get our arms around is those students who did not qualify, but the campaign was sufficient enough to inquire about our different academic programs and decided to continue to move forward enrolling with our institution. Well, I'm thinking we're also missing those students who may have been attracted to the college but didn't apply for financial aid. I guess, what I, I, what I guess I'm really trying to understand on slide 60, the success outreach plan you had, um, $671,000 spent on the add a class campaign in spring of 22. How many students received that $671,000? Yeah, we would have to pull the data and, and, okay. and, and define that a little bit further for you. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and it's, not that, it's not that I'm interested as a data point, I wanna know what we're learning and it, can that, is, is there some application to our marketing I mean, almost a million dollars is a lot of money spent on a campaign. Yes. And I want to understand what we're learning from that process. So that's, more I guess that's where I'm, yeah. That. More work needs to be on that. I'll give you the, those metrics. Because okay. I, I appreciate impressions. I mean, again, I'm generally in that business, and I, but, but that's, that is a, um, that's a, that's not a true outcome. <laughs> outcome is how many students and yes. are we helping? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Mr. Kelly, I'm not too sure if we answered your question. What was your question again? Well, I'm sorry, I, can you I, I, I get um, we're trying to attract students. Um, some qualified for the program. Some didn't qualify for the program. Some may have been attracted to college and didn't use the program. Um, so, we, I guess one of the one of the things is, do we ask students why are you here? Um, is it because of an ad campaign? Um, or some other reason. I mean, to get the numbers that Carol's talking about, yeah. I think we have to ask. Right? Because I look at our declining enrollment, which, which we know there's a lot of factors related to declining enrollment and what happened over the last two years. And then I look at our direct, the HERF funds that went directly to students. They can use them however they need to for 
food, lodging, transportation, whatever they need to use, pay their bills, whatever. So we don't have anything to do with that. That's a direct uh, contribution to, to a student. And then we have these monies that we're targeting to students to try to get them to take more classes, come and take a class on us, yes. whatever it's going to be. Yes. And how successful are those in an environment of still declining enrollment? Yes. So I'm, I'm trying to understand those those pieces of information and what's working and what's not. And if we find something that's working, do we need more resources to keep keep working it? Yeah. So we can probably provide you the data points based on this information that's here: number of students, how much was awarded, uh, and then we would probably need to do some additional work to drill down in, in the survey, survey type to understand what encouraged these students or what attracted the students to come uh, to our institution. Uh, but it'll be beyond, I guess, the marketing strategy, I would think, right? The, well, these are, different are we, campaigns. And Carol, I guess this is a question for you. Are we thinking that we want to see who is attracted by TV, who is attracted by radio? to um, understand which parts of the program are the most effective? That's less of importance to me is who are the students are responding to this and do we have students who are, who are maybe not scholarship eligible uh, mm -hmm. or maybe don't have the FAFSA that they've completed but something like this would be, again, I, I don't know all the parameters, but, but yes. why is this attractive to some students and not to others? Yes. And what can we learn about that? And, and are there, there are funds that we should be thinking about on a regular basis, strategic funds <coughs> we should be thinking about on a regular basis that encourage students to take an extra class on us to come and give us a try? What do we the, want to call the it? The add a class and the 800 on us was not predicated on financial aid uh, uh, you know, enrollment or, or that they had to qualify. Mm -hmm. Now the tag is predicated on them doing a FAFSA and being eligible and that we had to uh, leverage $59,983 uh, of the HER funds because we're trying to establish a baseline with continuing this on beyond uh, when the HERF dollars are no longer here. Yeah, and that I can get you that metric for tag. That is definitely uh, FAFSA predicated. But, but the other two were not. The other two were not. Yeah. And they, those are much bigger numbers, yeah. Right. So if I understand that the data points that we're really interested in is really, uh, is, is the one part that those individuals who did not receive financial aid, that's important to us to learn to say, hey, if there's additional need that's out there that's not being fulfilled through a federal grant or a straight funding grant, further discussions around what can we do a little bit different? What have we learned from this data? The other piece that I'm still trying to wrap my head around is, you know, uh, how effective are we looking to see how effective is our marketing strategy that any, I think is what I'm, I think I'm hearing from you, Mr. Kelly, is well, how effective our marketing strategy is and, you know, do, do we use something different? Uh, what, what venues do we have out there uh, to, to market our, our different programs and which is the most effective? Where can we get a bigger bang for our dollar? Well, is what I, I th think th I'm hearing. Well, you are. Um, when the HERF funds are gone, if we're going to spend a million dollars on advertising, it means we're not spending a million dollars on something else, right? And so we'd be very interested in whether it's effective, whether it's um, driving up enrollment, um, increasing awareness uh, to people who would benefit from our programs. Yes. M Mr. Kelly, I, I want to make sure I understand this. You mentioned if we're not spending a million dollars, we're spending it on something else. If we're not using her funds and we spend a million dollars, it's coming out of our budget, which means we're not using that million dollars somewhere else in our budget. So, so, so if I enter, it, 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 we may be talking about, correct me if I'm wrong, because these HERF dollars are gone, mm -hmm. right? I won't be able to spend a million dollars unless I redirect resources. That's exactly what I'm saying. Full resources from other areas to fund marketing strategies, I think is what I'm hearing. That's exactly what you're hearing. Okay. Well, we had a grant and we were able to spend a million dollars on these programs um, without um, taking it out of other programs, but that's not going to be true in the future. So is it possible that the recommendation is to uh, set aside dollars for marketing on top of possibly uh, additional financial aid gaps to fund f 
uh, financial aid needed gaps. Is that the recommendation that I'm well, I'm not making a recommendation. Oh, we don't okay. know how effective the campaign has been. Okay. We don't know whether that money would be well spent. We, we need to parse out that, that data yeah, further. Uh, Patricia has the data sets, and we need mm -hmm. to take it a little deeper and, and, uh, and establish what, what students were attached to what dollars. In other for, words, what... For example, the 800 on us campaign, which uh, specifically targeted uh, fall second eight weeks enrollment, uh, th we assisted 386 students with that $300,000. Uh, $300, mm -hmm. Okay, so, but I'll give you all the metrics for each one of those categories. Is it fair to say the question is, did, th did this ad drive these students to the college? Did yes. that campaign what, drive the students to the college? Mm -hmm. and but, but isn't it hard did, to tell did the it, offer, because it, it, it's, it's a substantive offer that is marketed, right. and, and I'm, I'm not trust your marketing. I'm, I'm not doubting mm -hmm. your marketing. I'm just wanting to know if the substantive offer was a catalyst to make students, we've, we've made an assumption about our students for a long time that they're part-time because of, because of their life choices, they have to work, they have their parenting, they're, they're doing a number of things. And one of our ongoing discussions has always been about semester credit hour and time to completion. As we potentially move to outcomes-based funding, then just counting a student in credit hours isn't going to be enough anymore. That conversation around completion has got to completely change all of our thinking. And so if adding a class on us, if encouraging students to take that second class, that, that second eight-week class on us is a true motivation, if that is a substantive offer to motivate a student to take more classes while they're here, to move from part-time to full-time, or move from part-time to more partly time, whatever you want to say it, then, then is that a substantive offer that we need to be thinking strategically about? I'm not, I'm not talking about marketing. No. I'm talking about the substantive offer, and do we need to be thinking strategically about what moves our students to take more classes and to complete at a, at a, a faster pace? Yep. The answer is yes. The short answer is yes, because, and um, after tomorrow's visit, this Friday, um, and my staff meeting that'll, that makes what I call my expanded staff meeting, will be uh, probably a group of about 30 or so of us uh, from, the, from the college to begin talking about how we're going to reposition uh, our resources to address uh, this potential new way of, of doing things. So that, that conversation starts. It actually started today, um, but it, we really have our first operational meeting this Friday morning yeah. from 8 o'clock to 10 o'clock yes. on that very topic. Things have got to change and in, in move in the way of outcome, um, <coughs> outcomes. Yeah, we'll still have inputs because you, know, you get revenue on, 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 on inputs and so forth, but, but how we're going to move to that outcomes base is gonna, um, um, going to change the way we do business dramatically. Yeah. We're not the only ones, but it's not going to wait. It's not going to be phased in. The word is from the commissioner is that this plan is we're moving in we're starting yes. next fall yeah. so we're gonna have to learn the four corners of the agreement of the of the uh of the um, commission plan to refinance and it's it's we're waiting for the final the debt with the devil and all in the details and everything else at this point yep. wait for it to go through um the legislative session and we're going to have to act yes now yes so definitely a, a lot of changes a lot of out of the box thinking uh, like the idea that, you know, uh, if we were going to uh, continue to add a class campaign, the challenge is that we may not, by compliance and state statute, we may not be able to find it, fund it through, through our operating budget. So we need to think about how else can we do the same thing. So more to come on that, definitely more, more thinking around the, the, those ideas. Okay. All right. So uh, moving right along. Uh, all right, professional development. Uh, Ms. Dr. Halcom, yes. Her funding has provided us with the opportunity to offer faculty expert training and online delivery of instruction. In March of 2020, all faculty had to convert to an online environment of their courses. Many faculty were already experts, but others had never taught in an online environment. We never want to be in that situation again. 
should COVID reemerge or we have a weather event, hurricane, et cetera. Uh, this funding provides us with the ability to prepare faculty and staff to continue operations of teaching classes if the college should close temporarily because of one of the events mentioned earlier. Our e-learning director, Janet Camps, has worked diligently to provide expert workshops and trainings. We have an upgraded faculty professional development room with updated equipment, such as laptops, keyboards, and a QSYS system. She has worked with colleagues who are experts in their fields from other companies or institutions to provide certified trainings in small groups and invited speakers for larger groups. A part-time worker has also been hired to assist in these trainings. One example of a workshop being offered just this week is by a professor at Texas State University who's experienced in teaching online and crafting high quality online courses. And that person will work more individually with students, I'm sorry, faculty in breakout rooms. Just since January of 2022, in collaboration with e-learning, there's been at least 39 professional development activities for faculty and staff that have been offered. Examples of these activities include the Texas Distance Learning Conference, Online Learning Consortium, or OLC, Advanced Teaching Certificate, OLC Instructional Design Certificates, OLC Master Series, Small Group Intensive Professional Development for New Online Courses, Online Technical Training Course, Canvas Topic Courses such as Inspired Leadership, Interactive Syllabi, student engagement strategies, and small group discussions with specialists. In addition to e-learning, the Faculty Professional Development Committee has and is working to acquire special speakers for sessions. Faculty also have had the opportunity to develop courses to be shared with their colleagues and for the department to use for new people who have not taught online before. The nurse education department has developed numerous courses to be shared. We have faculty members who serve as mentors who work with their colleagues. Training modules are in development. So our professional development is in progress and continuing. We need to do this in a continual basis. For new people, we constantly have new faculty coming on board each year. So those faculty that receive the certification are in a good position to help their new colleagues. Overall, providing faculty with the tools that they need to enhance the online delivery system produces a more successful student. And so we have developed the infrastructure to um, do more of our professional development training. So we're in a much better place than we were in March of 2020, thanks to the HERF funding. And like I said, we are continuing in the process till the end of the grant. And hopefully, we will be able to continue more robust professional training after the ending of the grant. Are any questions? OK, Dr. Lee, he'll discuss the technology piece. Good afternoon. Hello. IT has spent $6.2 million of her funding, of which 100% is encumbered and less than 3.5% remains to be paid, awaiting delivery of equipment or software. The funding has afforded the college greater flexibility in delivering instruction, provided around-the-clock technical and student support capabilities, and expanded our ability to perform its business function remotely, all in a safer online environment. If you recall, this funding was allocated to the four categories as depicted on the slide and the percentages as indicated. The bulk of the funding went to cybersecurity network services, where we have expanded the college's network bandwidth from one to 10 gigabit to handle more connections and to mitigate interruptions as we moved all instructional and business functions online. But in doing so, we've also increased our exposure to cyber threats with the increased number of connected devices, such as remote desktops, laptops, tablets, smartphones, smartwatches, and printers, which when connected to our network are classified as endpoints each now a potential entry point for a cyber criminal, as those devices may not be compliant with the school's security requirements with updated security patches or OSs. 
Her funding has allowed the college to acquire and install advanced preemptive de threat detection tools that go beyond traditional authentication protocols, antiviruses, firewalls that keep threats out to a system that monitors all those devices connected to networks for threats that now come from within. With the capability to detect suspicious online behavior, file changes, abnormal access patterns through the use of machine learning that can trigger the initial intervention to neutralize or isolate those threats for analysis and remediation by our IT staff. During this period, email became a critical tool for everyday communications between students, faculty, and staff. But this is also a popular attack vector among threat actors trying to steal sensitive data such as social security numbers, employee data, bank information, or simply to hold them for ransom. The college has now installed and now configuring a best-in-class email security solution to prevent, detect, and respond to email-based threats such as spam, phishing, malware, business, and email com compromise attacks. Our entire data system is supported by a robust backup and disaster recovery system, partly funded by HERF. To complete this category, laptops were purchased and provided to staff so that the entirety of businesses, financial aid, and advising can be functioned performed remotely. For remote learning technology, we have purchased hundreds of laptops for students without adequate com computers so they can access their online classes or to attend classes remotely. Additional hotspots were installed throughout the various campuses to increase Wi-Fi accessibility. We also provide faculty with laptops for them to transform their current classes for remote delivery or to support hybrid courses. Many of our classrooms have had their cameras and microphones upgraded or refreshed to improve both video and sound quality to allow students to see and hear more clearly for better class participation, while other classrooms have now received their first installation of these devices to be capable of remote delivery in the future. In addition, we've installed eight conferencing systems to deliver synchronous remote classroom instructions for credit, dual credit, workforce, continuing education, and staff training classes. In the area of virtual student support, to provide 24-7 on-demand help, the college installed and configured two AI technology-powered chatbot systems that promote persistence and, and success. For hardware, software, or LMS questions, we have Black Belt Help. For student engagement and communication, we are currently configuring Ocelot to provide technology-assisted help on questions dealing with enrollment, financial aid, advising, and important deadlines. Both systems can, be, can connect students to live technicians or advisors during normal working hours. Finally, in virtual desktops, we use Adobe Sign to conduct complete business transactions where signing documents and collecting signature is completed online and legal, such as in processing financial aid or scholarship documents, or to document signer workflows to improve tracking and audibility of business processes, as found in the grant proposal process, travel requests, and expense reimbursements. In the purchasing office, Bonfire e-procurement, when completely implemented, will allow streamlined tracking and approval for price-only bidding as well as to simplify the complex request for proposal process by replacing traditional paper-based vendor submissions and evaluation sheets with interactive electronic-based documentation and guided workflow. In summary, HERFIS afforded the college greatly enhanced technology cap capability to perform its primary function, to provide instruction and perform all of its normal business and student support functions remotely in a more secure and safe environment. Questions? Thank you, Dr. Lee. Health safety facility enhancements, $2.7 million spent. We're almost complete with all these projects. We've got purchase orders issued. We've got some last emergency generators that help support IT that are in place, getting in place to be complete by the end of the calendar year. So what we've worked on are several different projects that improve the safety of our faculty, staff, students, and visitors. We've been put in place touchless water fountains and restroom fixtures throughout the district. We've improved the indoor air quality with ionizers that work not just against the COVID virus, but also just against the overall indoor air quality. We've purchased uh, personal protective equipment supplies, disinfecting supplies, and dividers. We've installed outdoor furniture, so we have outdoor gathering spaces. And this last piece is critical about the uh, emergency generators that IT had identified as shortfall and their wireless coverage, 
and we're installing these two emergency generators, one at the CED and one at the Windward campus. Questions? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Travis. Okay, uh, Madam Chair, Mr. President, and members of the board, that concludes our presentation. Are there any questions? I don't see any. Thank you very much. And Thank again, you. apologize for uh, hijacking your presentation on the, in, the <laughs> enrollment questions. I was just, I mean, the marketing questions. I was no. just trying to understand. Wonderful ideas. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. All right, we will move into our college president's report. As you can see on this agenda, we are report heavy today because we are action light. So we're doing lots of reports today. Um, we're going to start with uh, understanding our SAC COC substantive change process. Mr. Dr. Escamilla. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. On October 2nd through the 5th, we hosted a SAC COC uh, representatives, a group of representatives for an in-person in -person visit to confirm findings on prior virtual visits. And the previous visits were in October of 2020 for the reaffirmation of an end accreditation, reaffirmation of accreditation um, for, um, that occurred, uh, let me see, on November 2021 for the substantive change visit for the BSN program. All that to say is they came face to, finally got them on, on campus face to face for a, a, a reaffirmation and final step in level two. Uh, certification. That was a very big deal that occurred, and it was very quiet, but it was a, it was a small group um, led by our SAC COC vice president, vice president, Dr. Mike Hofer, and the chair of our reaffirmation review committee, J Jane McGuire. They spent a couple of full days here meeting with faculty and staff and students. Um, at the conclusion of their visit, they were uh, very impressed with everything, and, and they just had to come and, in, in their words, use a, or have a perfunctory uh, albeit obligatory visit visit to 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 make uh, the final steps in that uh, level change. Um, that being said, we expect from the broader picture uh, for to be hosting uh, another SACS COC team here in 2026-27 of the academic year 26-27 um, as part of our fifth year uh, reporting, and so that'll be the the midpoint for our, our decennial visit um, that'll come. Uh, five years after that and so heads up there it was a real uh, that was a big deal level two status for 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 a community college is a big deal and um rumor has it we'll be coming back to you with some other ideas because some people can't sit still as if we just hadn't i know i'm just kidding our faculty and staff are very eager and and they've got some great ideas and i i, I already have them on my desk i'll be coming back to you for for other level two discussions uh, also, um, as you have noticed, you know, being here in the uh, at the Oso Creek campus is a big deal, and, and not only here, but I, I want to talk a little bit about the accommodations that Del Mar College makes for our very most important democratic process, uh, by way uh, being our in this being Tuesday election day and the like. I want y'all to know that um, we do this every ele uh, election cycle. We're great partners with 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 the. Uh, with the county and we have four sites open till 7 p.m. today uh, obviously here at the Oso Creek uh, campus at our culinary arts building up on the, uh, down on the south side as you walked in maybe you may have seen uh, all the election signs and everything going on uh, we also have continue to have uh, elections both early election early voting and and uh, regular voting today at the heritage campus heritage campus the Heldenfels administration building uh, out at our Win Windward campus, we have um, uh, elections being held, uh, voting being held rather, at the Emergency Training Building, or otherwise known as the FEMA Dome, and then also at the Center for Economic Development, Room 106, also known as our regular boardroom. Um, yeah, I, I, I make this point to to let everybody know that you know taxpayers and voters and the like um, have voted for us over the years and have been very very supportive. Um, we are the community's college, and I just want you all to know that we participate in every which way we can. Augie and I and, and, and Jessica Alanese and Ms. McDonald and others do everything we can to, to integrate into the community and provide those services. So I think it's a very proud moment today um, um, and as being a, being a part of our democratic process. Process is very important. Next um, subject is... Um, 
uh, the, the fall commencement. So the fall 2022 uh, commencement ceremony will be held on Friday, December 16th at 7 p.m. at the American Bank Center. Uh, we are working on finding a, a keynote speaker. I think we may have one, but we'll hold off till next next board meeting right before, or I'll make an announcement just here in a little bit to, in, a, in a few coming days to, to talk about that. But it'll be at the American Bank Center. It'll be a big graduation, so get ready. Um, let me see, two more updates. Really, uh, update here on the Oso Creek campus. You know, it, it, it is kind of a, it, we're, we're almost done with construction. Uh, the Oso Creek uh, is entering the final phases of construction and is on track to be fully open construction-wise as well as, as as much as we can instructionally wise, instructional wise, uh, for the uh, spring 2023 semester. The STEM and the culinary arts uh, buildings are fully open and had classes this semester. What I mean by fully open is construction wise. We still have some restrictions in some cases. We're not fully open that way with, with our full inventory of courses, but stay tuned. Those will be ratcheting up as we move ahead. The temporary certificate of occupancy of the administration building was issued October 26th. That's the, the building or administration building on that other side of the, of, of the pond. Um, furniture has been moved in, those sorts of things. I walked the whole campus yesterday. There, there are a scant few, but albeit there's a small team, a small contingent out there and operating receiving students. Uh, construction of the pond, the water feature, is progressing with some delays due to recent rains. Kind of ironic, uh, our water pond is slow because of water. But uh, it's coming. And Regent Goddess, I don't know if there'll be any fish, or someone was asking, maybe it was a Regent Adama that was asking about the fish. I, I, I'll, I'm going to reserve that for, for John. Two bus stops are under construction on the campus by the Corpus Christi Regional Economic Transportation Authority. That's uh, where you see the, the, black, the black felt outline just a little west of here down Yorktown, that's where the big bus stop's gonna be. It's gonna be a big one. And, and so that's gonna, they'll be moving things forward and um, scraping the ground and doing all those other things, doing site work prep and so forth. Uh, also, the city of Corpus Christi Police Training Academy has been advertised for construction bids. I just spoke to a couple folks yesterday. Um, so they're going out for bids again and we'll, we'll get back to you as far as that goes because that'll be coming shortly thereafter. Finally, spring 2023 registration for classes began yesterday. Several registration events are being held this month and next month for, the, for the, all three campuses to help students with the process. And I hope my son Benjamin is, is listening because he needs to register for the spring semester. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions for Dr. Escamilla? I, I have one item um, and I missed it. I'm, I apologize, I stepped out. It was during the enrollment visit and I just want to bring this up. It, it goes back to the enrollment report and I think, Patricia, if you can come back up here, I think we, we, we may do a redo on a, on a so the, 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 yeah, let's go ahead and pull this up. I, I, I've never done this, but I, it, it's important because I, I do want to bring up a, a bit of clarity and I know we're running, trying to, Patricia, I, I texted Patricia and to see how she explained this while I stepped out, I apologize. <clears throat> So we had 10,000 change, 10,000 and something credit mm -hmm. students enroll for the first part of fall. I just want to, I just want to reemphasize in case it wasn't clear. Um, that th this, that flex number is, uh, is from, that we're getting from the summer, but the flex yes. number that, uh, that's not represented here, that is too soon to get, rep get represented on the spring slide is that uh, for second, fall second eight weeks, we have a... Um, second eight weeks of fall semester. Of fall so these are, these are students currently that enrolled. are here and, and currently enrolled. We have 2,486 students. So that metric will get reported with whatever we have for spring 22. So, so yeah, and, and I don't wanna say they don't care, but right now I don't really care about the, the, that, that, that report necessarily. I'm just trying to make sure we understand that there is a, there's a big number ebbing and flowing here. And it's 10,000, there's, there's 279 from summer that are being counted in. And so there's, there's, there's all that, there's 10,000. And then we're just talking on the credit side. Right, so, so. you know, the, 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 the 10,000 for- yeah. go, go back to the next slide real quick. The spring? 
Uh, no, 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 no. Um, well, the flex, the, 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 17. the, the, the summer, the, the, the 2400, where are they? The 2400 second eight weeks. That they're not, they're not represented there. That's they're, my point. They're not represented okay, there yet. That's my point. There's a whole other segment in the current semester. We're currently serving 12,486 students, although that's, that's not represented there because the 2486 is what we what will report in spring 23. So when I reviewed this Sunday, I said make a mental note. And when did Mark step out uh, when y'all were when y'all were talking about this? So I guess there's a bigger number there in. What I'm curious about, and I think I've said this before, I, we always want to report to the state what the state wants us to report in the format in which they want us to report it. Right. Fine. What makes sense to us, and as we're moving to outcomes-based, one, one of the pipeline questions is going to be what's enrollment, how many semester credit hours or people enrolled, contact hours, whatever we want that to be so that we can track our progression and know are we reaching the milestones we need to reach to, for the outcomes to be what they need to be. That's so maybe at a as the board thinks about our retreat for next spring, that can be one of the conversations that we have, or what are the data points that we need as a board to understand the pipeline and understand how are we gonna reach the outcomes. So we can continue to report to the state what they want in the format they wanted, but what we wanna hear is what's our what's what are the data points that, that mean we're progressing and yep. that's that's the conversation as opposed to parsing over when we get to count eight week versus flex versus a I, may I, mess or whatever that that's what gets challenging for that, us that's why i said y'all don't yeah. care that's exactly what i was referring to and so as we as we, we get care. ready yeah i know you care i'm 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 just i'm being facetious here it, it's it's a there's a bigger number of students that we're moving through. I just don't want you all to leave thinking, oh my gosh, enrollment's down and it's this way, but, it, but, but is it really? We may have started that way. The indicators that aren't being reflected here is that, is that the students are finally starting to come back because that 2,400 numbers, that 2,408, 24, what 2486. was it? 2,486. 2,486 students is, is actually a, 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 a step up I mean, it, it's a step up. It's a, it's a, last spring we had 17-19. Last, okay. Yep, 17-19. Last year this time, in that number of students in the second eight weeks, we had 1,700 students enrolling in the second eight weeks of fall. This time we have 2,486. 2,486. That's what's not being reflected in here. And that's, that's the point that I want to make. There, are, there's, there is a movement. There is a movement towards... I think students are starting to come out of their more credit students are starting to come out of the COVID fog and so forth and they're starting to come back to school so that number was missed there I just don't want y'all to leave with that 10,000 number in your head um, and that's not including the CE students okay mm -hmm. so here we have 10,000 in the first part of fall. Okay, some of those moved over and took the second eight weeks and whatever, and that number is now 24. And then on top of that is a big CE number that you all reviewed that I probably missed too. And I apologize for that. So my point is, getting back to exactly what you said, those numbers are in there sprinkled throughout. It's the way we're reporting to you all that's still um, the way the state expects it and we're going to get away from that and we're going to we're, what i'm trying to do is change the way the state expects to read it and, and just stay tuned on that again many more students than than, than is being reflected on these numbers I, I i just had to make that point madam chair i apologize for that's right. reviewing that but that's i right. thought that was important thank you. thank you other questions or comments for dr escamilla so we'll move on to our pending business uh, items that are in our packet. You'll see that in December, our, uh, some of the reports are going to include our internal auditors will come back to us. We'll hear uh, our foundation annual update. Uh, we'll begin to talk about student charges. We won't make that decision on student f tuition and fees until February, but we begin to have that discussion in December, and we'll have our professional contract review. We'll obviously also be doing our... Uh, 
saying goodbye to our uh, outgoing board members and uh, we'll be uh, d giving the oath of office to our incoming board members at that December meeting as well. We'll talk a little bit about, about that in calendaring. Um, not yet. Um, and then we're not sure if we're going to do the strategic plan, the coordinating board strategic plan update in December or wait till February. Kind of depends on how the rest of the December calendar shakes out. Uh, we do want to begin having the board annual self-evaluation and retreat conversation in that February time frame, February, March. So we'll be looking at kind of the start of our uh, board governance biennium uh, in the spring and looking at that uh, opportunity for our self-evaluation and uh, board retreat as well. Any questions on our pending items? If not, we will move on to our consent agenda. We have uh, three items on our consent agenda, approval of minutes, acceptance of investment, and financials. Uh, those are provided to the board in advance. Is there any item that needs to be removed for separate consideration? Seeing none, is there a motion to adopt the consent agenda items as presented? Thank you, Mr. Garza. Second? Is there a second to that motion to accept? Dr. Villarreal, thank you very much. Any questions on the motion? Any public comment on the motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed, same sign. That motion passes unanimously. We do not have any regular action items for today, but we do have a closed session. So I'm going to um, ask the board stay here for closed session uh, and ask the rest of the room to clear yourself out. And while you do that quietly, I'll read the closed session language. Under Texas Government Code 551.071 regarding the pending or contemplated litigation or settlement offer with possible discussion and action in open session, and the seeking of legal advice from counsel on pending legal or contemplated matters or claims with possible discussion and action in open session, and under Texas Government Code 551.074 regarding the appointment, employment, evaluation, reassignment, duties, discipline, or dismissal of public office officer or employee with possible discussion and action in open session. And the time is 3.30 p.m. We need to take a <laughs> Thank you. The board has returned from closed session at 3.47 p.m. We have no action items coming out of closed session. Looking at our calendar uh, for the remainder of the month, again, we are hosting uh, Dr. Harrison Keller, Commissioner of Higher Education, tomorrow here at the Oso Creek campus for that South Texas Regional Workshop. Uh, we do have our scholarship reception next Tuesday the 15th uh, on the uh, Windward campus. And so if you have not rsvp to that, please let Delia and Mary McQueen know. And then we do have two regents who are prepared to canvas the election delia. We know who those two uh, regents are who are gonna canvas. Are we looking for volunteers? Not yet, if we can get two. So do we have two volunteers who are available to canvas elections on the 18th? I'm available if there's one other person, Dr. Mr. Garza. Okay. Anybody else who wants to show up, you're welcome to join us. On the 18th. On the 18th, and that's at noon. What time are we gonna do that, at noon, Delia? Yeah. Okay, and so if anybody else is available, please let Delia know. In December, we have our uh, Coordinating Board Leadership Conference in Austin. Uh, it starts, Delia just sent a link out to the regions. It starts uh, early morning on the 7th. You'd have to go in the afternoon of the 6th, uh, and it, so it's early morning on the 7th through uh, lunchtime on the 8th. And then on the 13th, we will have our uh, board meeting back here. Uh, we'll do a luncheon uh, prior. Actually, I'm not sure the exact timing. What we've typically done in the past is to do kind of an outgoing recognition, allow our outgoing uh, regents to bring a significant other or, or guest with them. Uh, and the same thing for our incoming regents uh, to bring a friend or family who are gonna be attending with them as well. Uh, so we will do the official swearing in at 1 p.m. Um, I think we'll look at whether or not we do something early. We've gotta coordinate that final schedule, but we'll do that very soon. And then our season celebration uh, and fall graduation will be on December the 16th with winter break on December 21st. We're already talking about winter break. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions or comments? The seasonal celebration will be in this room. Oh, it will be in this room. Well, so we'll have our, and, and with our students um, cooking. No. 
we have great, great opportunities to show off our students, our culinary students in the future. And again, uh, on the 16th, yes. Uh, season celebration is at 11, and then graduation is that night at 7 p.m. We will not have a regular board meeting in January, but there is a community college day uh, in Austin on the 26th. Uh, and included in that, uh, the Community College Association of Texas Trustees is offering a new regent orientation that we will offer to uh, our newly elected regents on the 27th up in Austin as well. Uh, with that, we are uh, finished with our meeting and adjourn at 3.50 p.m. Thank you all. <laughs>